Uh, before we begin, let's introduce ourselves, starting to my left. Uh, Gary Casada. Dan Godek. Charlene Douglas, Mayor Pro Tem. Ann Vara. Tim Twing, Director of Community Development. Ann Beakey. Eric Kluster. Thank you. We have a quorum. Next item is the approval of minutes for August 13th. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Godek. Is there support? Support. Moved by Ms. Douglas. Any discussion on these minutes? Seeing all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Okay, next up we have uh, public comment on non agenda items. Is there anybody here that would like to speak to the commissioner on a non agenda item? Okay, not seeing any hands. We'll close the public comment on non, non agenda items. And then we're going on to um, item D. This is new business. This is a public hearing. It's a special land use permit and site plan to install 250 foot wireless communication support, ATT mobility within off street parking lot at 421 South Williams. Mr. Twing. Uh, this site is in the uh, Central Business District. Um, it, it is on the uh, southeast corner of 4th and Williams uh, and, and extends over to a portion of Troy Street. Uh, the petitioner is proposing to install wireless communication tower and support structure. Uh, it is considered a special land use in the zoning ordinance and allowed as a special land use in any zoning district provided they provide a presentation that uh, uh, reasonably uh, determines that it's necessary uh, at that location. Uh, as you indicated, the proposed tower is a total height of 250 feet. Uh, <coughs> it is serving a dual purpose um, in that AT&T would be installing antennas at about 160 feet based on the plan. And then the uh, Oakland County Emergency Services uh, would be st stalling facilities at the top of the tower to provide service at that location uh, and, and the overall height. I would point out as in, in the report that this is intended to replace the tower that is behind City Hall and the police station. Uh, it's not a new tower in addition to that, uh, but the tower behind uh, City Hall would be replaced and tore down as part of the uh, Civic Center project and become part of the park. And this is the location that was uh, proposed as an alternative. I know that several other locations uh, have been discussed, uh, and I think the petitioners may get into where else they looked or, or didn't. But anyways, um, as part of the uh, special <coughs> land use requirements, um, the towers or structures are required under the ordinance to have uh, uh, setbacks from streets and residential zoned properties in equivalent distance as the height. Uh, so you'll see in our report that uh, we've identified that the uh, closest uh, residential zone is 220 feet away uh, over off of Troy Street uh, to the east, southeast. Uh, that site, uh, although zoned uh, uh, one family residential, is uh, a vacant gravel lot that's often used for parking. Uh, the other setbacks from the uh, East 4th Street, Troy Street, uh, East 5th Street, and William Street are all listed uh, at uh, uh, less than the uh, 250 feet. Uh, so as part of your review as a special land use, you would have to grant uh, permission for uh, the petitioner to seek those variances from the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, uh, if this goes forward. Other elements of the plan, and, I, and the petitioner can walk through the presentation in a minute, but the other elements are basically around the support structure. At the bottom, uh, they will have uh, the equipment sheds uh, for potential tenants as well as existing. Uh, they are proposing an eight-foot fence uh, with some barbed wire strands on top of that that would uh, <clears throat> simply go around those uh, equipment sheds or trailers. Uh, there is no other landscaping or screening uh, proposed at that, that location. In addition to that, there's uh, the chain link fence that's six feet uh, high along the outside of the parking lot adjacent to the sidewalk and the streets. And again, there's no other uh, landscaping or screening proposed at the perimeter of the parking lot. Uh, with that, that's kind of an overview of what the uh, special land use uh, uh, 
report indicates. Um, so there would be two steps in the uh, document. One would be the special land use, and the second would be a site plan review. I'll quit there, and if there are any questions. Any questions, Mr. Twain? Uh, you mentioned this would um, service Oakland County Emergency Services. Yes. Is that through the sheriff's office? Uh, the help? police chief can get into who it serves okay. and, and, and the things when he gives that okay. part of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from the petitioners. You could introduce Just, yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Just let me know when you want me to change the slide. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Dobbenmeyer. I'm with Fortune Wireless, and I'm representing AT&T on this proposed installation. Um, do have a presentation, but Tim, I think you did a fairly good job and covered most of the points I would be uh, touching on anyways. Um, one thing I do want to go over, though, is the setback issue, which I want to make a point that the fact that this tower is being removed, not only AT&T, and then I'm sure the police chief will get into it as well, we need a new tower uh, as close as possible as we can get it, and it just so happens to be that AT&T owns property two blocks down. Uh, so it really works for all par parties, and the tower will actually be designed uh, with a fall zone radius. And, Tim, if you want to take it all the way down um, to the last couple of slides, please, and I can go over the fall zone radius with everyone. Because oftentimes um, a, the major concern with having a tower in such a condensed area uh, such as this is what happens if it falls well first and foremost in the very unlikely event that it does fall uh, it will be designed uh, to collapse amongst itself it buckles at certain points um, on the tower and it will co collapse within a 20-foot radius of itself uh, right there on that slide Tim that is a fall zone letter from the tower manufacturer stopped by or stamped by a structural engineer uh, confirming what I just said, that in the unlikely event that the tower failed, uh, it would collapse within 20 feet of itself. And if you want to scroll down, Tim, um, I've got the 20-foot radius identified here. It's fully contained uh, within the parking lot area, so at t building wouldn't be at risk. Uh, the right-of-ways wouldn't be at risk, and the, uh, I think it's a VFW post building would not be at risk either. Um, Really, that's all I want to touch on. I, I know we, as far as landscaping, not a ton of options. It's a parking lot area. I actually just walked down there before the meeting. Um, not a lot of space for landscaping. And to be honest, if we put landscaping and tore asphalt up and attempted to plant landscaping, it's likely going to die um, at some point in time anyways. Uh, what we are willing to do after discussing it with AT&T to try to uh, beautify the property and, and make it a little more easier on the eyes is put a vinyl fence in around our compound um, that would completely um, sh shield the uh, antenna, uh, I'm, I apologize, ground equipment, uh, so at t shed, any future co-locators. Um, and then we would also be willing to, if the Planning Commission would like us to, uh, remove the chain lake fence and put in a raw iron fence, also making it a little easier on the eyes. Um, with that said, as I said, Tim did a pretty good job. Really, I'd just like to take any questions you guys may have, and then I'm sure um, police of chief, or chief of police would like to say a few things on his department's behalf as well. Thank you. Ms. Douglas and then Mr. Godek. I wasn't clear about the vinyl fence and the iron fence. Where, okay. what do you tell, um, describe the, that in more detail? The vinyl fence will actually, and Tim, if you want to scroll up to the <clears throat> site plan page, the vinyl fence will actually go around our compound, so that will shield the tower and all of AT&T's equipment and any future equipment that may go in there uh, for any future co-locators or anything like that. Uh, one more down, Tim. I'm sorry, a couple more down. One more. Nope, one more. Sorry. One more. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> I, right here, right here, right here. Okay, there's the compound. Uh, so that would be the vinyl fencing. Uh, vinyl fencing would be a complete, uh, I don't want to call it a barricade, but it's going to completely um, shield the equipment on the ground and the base of the tower itself. Around the property north and uh, west parts of the parking lot is a chain <clears> leak <throat> fence. We would be willing to go ahead and replace that with a wrought iron fence. It's a little nicer than what's currently installed. 
Okay, thanks. Mr. Kodak? Uh, I, I still, uh, on the same subject, the, the height of the vinyl fence would be eight feet? Uh, they're generally six to eight feet. It depends on what the preference is. Well, you said it would shield the structures around it from, uh, from view. And given the perspective, your, your sheds are probably going to be uh, taller than the fence, and it's going to be pretty close to those sheds. So the concern would be that <clears throat> I'd see a vinyl fence with these little uh, canopies of outbuildings above it. <clears throat> and would it, um, I, I take it it would eliminate the barbed wire aspect of this fence as well? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Generally, we wouldn't put barbed wire on top of a vinyl fence. Um, and then as far as the ground equipment, this is actually, I don't want to call it a shed. They used to put up um, shelter buildings, which are the very large 12 by 30 buildings that we used to see. But um, those have really become obsolete today. So we're not using those. The sheds that are we putting in now are outdoor or outdoor cabinets are much smaller, um, not only in size, but also in height. Um, so a six to foot six foot to eight foot fence would really do um, a very good job at screening that. I don't want to say you won't completely see it, um, but as you said, you might just see the top. I would really have to look at the specs of how tall this shed is, but as I said, they're, they're generally much smaller today than they used to be. I guess if I had a preference, um, just so that it would <clears throat> shield as much as possible, it would be like eight foot and possibly with like a, even like a lattice structure decorating the top of it. Uh, to get the maximum height out of it. Um, and um, on another topic uh, that I was going to ask about is there has been some other designs of towers um, that kind of make them look less like towers, um, at least for a portion of them, you know, whether it's some wrap around them or like uh, fake uh, ivy or even um, the portion of them becoming a flagpole. Okay. Um, uh, the issue with a stealth structure, um, you'd be looking like, um, so an example would be a monopine, what we call a monopine. It looks like a pine tree, uh, but we're in a downtown area. So any stealth tree structure of any kind is really going to look more out of place than what a standard tower would, especially when um, there's already a tower here, so I feel that the community's already adjusted to seeing it. Um, this is going to be very similar in nature, and a flagpole is essentially that limits what AT&T can put in there, and not only will limit AT&T, but it's also going to prevent the city uh, police department and the county emergency communications from really utilizing it either. Um, in order for all three parties to, to appropriately use it as they use this, we, we have to have uh, the self-supporting structure that we're proposing in the application. Is it uh, just an unpainted aluminum structure? Yeah, it's like a, it would be like a uh, very similar. So I believe it's a gray color, like a galvanized steel gray color. Is it is it uh, a, a coated uh, material or is it just a? Uh... It's galvanized. Okay. Great. Thanks for the answers. You're welcome. Yes, Ms. Douglas. Yeah, following up on that, uh, so the current structure, the current what we have now, there are boxes around underneath it that are, are way more than you know eight feet tall. Yeah. Is that going to? How tall are the structures going to be connected with this one? Those appear to be sitting up. I, I couldn't really see because there's a wood fence, but. The way I just, as walking by, it appears that they're sitting on some kind of raised platform almost. Um, at this location, we're not going to have uh, a raised platform. Uh, you would probably have, um, a, and I, I do apologize, I should know this, but I don't, either a concrete platform or the, uh, the platform, a steel platform that would set maybe six inches off the ground. So. It, it looks to me at this tower here that there's an elevated platform out here uh, by several feet elevation with a um, shed on top of it. So my, my question being apropos of um, Commissioner Godek's questions, would an eight-foot vinyl fence hide all the stuff around the base of the tower? You want to take it? So I'm the one that originally met with the chief of the city about putting the tower in. My name is Brad Riggs. I'm also with Fortune Wireless. 
the AT&T equipment will be hidden. I have no idea what the chief of the county is going to put in. Maybe he can answer that. Uh, but we will put in a vinyl fence. Typically, a shelter is 11 foot tall, the old style. Uh, if you're using the old style, there will be 11 foot tall because you have to have a drop ceiling and so on and so forth. The shelter or the building that we're going to use is called a wick. It's small. It's, it's like seven by seven because the radio equipment that we're using now at AT&T is much less than they used to be in the large building that you see behind the police station. So ours will be within that eight foot. It's only about seven and a half feet tall. So if we go eight foot and put your pretty lattice work around the top of it, takes away a little bit, but it, like I said, I'm not sure what the county's gonna put in. That's up to the county. Okay. But we're not here for the county. We're here for the tower and AT&T. Sure. So I wish I could tell you more. That's Okay, thanks. So then the other question is, I mean, the current design shows chain link with, you know, barbed wire on it. Why is that barbed wire, why is that there, and why would it not be necessary if we had a vinyl fence? It's just something that's been standard mm -hmm. with the industry for the last 25 years. So it's, it, I mean, there's no data that shows that it's a risk and that people are, you know, trying to break into the... Oh, people probably try to break in, but they got to get through a vinyl fence and climb an eight-foot fence as opposed to a six-foot with, with barbed wire on it now. So, okay. I mean, I'm sure the police chief will... Someone wants to get over, around around to get over the fence yeah. no matter what we have up there, to be honest with you. But there's a lot less copper there now, so the copper thieves don't don't go there much anymore. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gasana. Um, I don't know if the other gentleman might be the one to answer this question. On drawing C2, it, this is the plan view. It shows some equipment. Then it shows future tenant yep. in the northwest corner and future tenant in the southwest corner. Right. It, are those the places where the county would put their equipment? I believe so. And is the county going to use both those places, or is there yet a possibility of another tenant who we don't know that might place equipment there? Um, I'm not sure how much the county is going to use. If they're going to use them both, then there will be one spot left probably okay. for, a, for another tenant. All right. Um, these are pretty big foundations you're putting in, yes? I mean, well, here's my question. Get right to the point. Aren't you digging up all this asphalt here to put in uh, foundations? All the asphalt will be taken out. All the asphalt within the compound. Okay. So you're you're stripping the asphalt out of there. Um, and uh, how many parking spots are you are you I'm losing? You haven't. We're 40, 50 by fifty. I believe. Yeah, forty by fifty. So. Okay, I'm just, the reason I'm bringing it up is that you're opening up the asphalt there. It's not a little strip. It's not one of those, uh, this is going to be, there's going to be an opportunity here to, to open up a lot of, uh, of, of, of ground, it seems to me. And I, I, you, are you worried about losing parking spaces? Who? Four people work in that office. Okay. Um, all right. That's the landscape. All right. Um, Another quick question. One of the things in the report says that it will meet the requirements of FAA, FCC, Michigan Aeronautics. I don't know what those are. Can you just explain to us what that means? Uh, the FCC is the Federal Communications uh, Commission, so they regulate uh, essentially towers and RF emissions, and then the FAA, uh, we'd have to file with the FAA to determine what, whether or not um, we have to register a tower, make sure we're not in a flight path, uh, whether the tower has to be lit, uh, what kind of lighting, things like that. Okay, that was more of my question. How, how would any of those regulations, if you know, manifest visibly or physically in this installation? I'm sorry, I'm, can you clarify? You, you mentioned lights, for instance. Yes. I, I'm just wondering if the, any of these regulations the, are going to create a need to do something physically with this installation that we're going to see. Well, since it's over 200 feet, I would imagine that we're likely going to have to light the tower. And the type of lighting is going to be up to the FAA. So whether it's um, a white light uh, or a red light, that is all going to come back in the report once we file with the FAA. They're going to tell us what we need to do. All right. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Ms. Beakey. 
Um, I appreciate the idea of uh, improving the original chain link fence to the others that you've mentioned. Um, but, but going on the point that, again, you do have to tear up the asphalt and you don't really need that much parking. And given our issues with flooding and others that we've looked at, I wonder if there's any way to, again, replace any, rather than put back asphalt, put in permeable pavers for the parking areas. And again, reconsider putting some basic permeable, again, wild grasses, tall grasses, something else besides straight up parking lot. Because as you see, you just went by, it's pretty hideous as it is. And if it's not being used, I mean, a chain link fence in a parking lot that's unused is kind of like the saddest thing ever. Um, and so, I mean, I appreciate you mentioning these aesthetic issues because this will be something that will be with us for, I think, a long time. These towers probably have a life use of how long? 10 years, 20, 30? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not a short-term investment. So once you're doing all that work, well, it, the I, I city, think I think, would appreciate doing something as good as possible in that space. You have the wrong idea. We're only going to tear up the area around yeah. right the square. The that yes. little square. Okay. And we have to put rock back down so we can get the grounding rings in, so we can ground everything. So then we have to bring fiber in. <coughs> and power in so well, i understand that you, he just mentioned the asphalt being torn up so i guess the question would be is why is at t not doing more with the parking lot which maybe is not the question for you oh we're still going to use the parking lot i mean we're not gonna i'm not sure what the question is my question is is there an opportunity to improve the, both the aesthetic and the environmental nature of what's being input there to help Beautify both the downtown area as well as improve drainage. That's those are my questions. Uh, we didn't do research on your drainage uh, because this is the parking lot's been there for a lot longer than you know most of downtown, I think. Uh, but we will make every effort to make it, it it'll be it'll go from impervious to pervious, the part that we're taking care okay. of. Okay. That's something. Thank you. Mr. Gorek. I'd like to follow up on that and, and um, actually have this committee consider um, that as one of the caveats for um, <clears throat> improving this um, section, like like uh, Ann just mentioned. Um, uh, you know, let's, let's put in a few native plantings and um, improve the drainage on it. Um, it's an opportunity um, to make it look a little bit better, and uh, uh, I think that should be one of the things we require. Any other questions for the petitioner? Yes, Mr. Kluster. Uh, and sheet C8 in this package indicates a wooden fence on galvanized posts. Um, so I, I'm seeing details that are different from what's noted on the plans and different from what's suggested. Is there difficulty providing a, a wood fence on galvanized posts instead of the vinyl or the chain link that's been discussed? And you're referring to the compound, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, uh, no, there isn't. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm sure at and would prefer to put up a wood fence. It's probably cheaper. Um, Based on some of our discussions with uh, some of the folks that have called in about the application, um, there was concerns about making a, beautifying the, that compound a little bit, making it nicer, screening in the equipment. So uh, AT&T allowed us to bring up a vinyl fence. Uh, ultimately, if the Planning Commission would rather have a chain link fence, we'd be more than happy to do that. If you'd rather have a wood fence, we'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Douglas. Actually, I have a question for Mr. Twing. Um, this building being in the downtown footprint is not required to provide any parking at all, correct? Yes. Um, so even if, I mean, right now you've got four people working in that, that big building, even if it were converted into an office building and you had 200 people working there, they still wouldn't need to provide any parking at all? Unless it was a hotel or residential, no. Okay, thank you. Sorry, that Keith? Thank you. Um, just if I could give everyone a little bit of background on what the tower is. Currently, the tower behind the police station is at least 250 feet thereabouts. The only light is a red light. It's not 
illuminated. Um, that is a regional asset, but the city of Royal Oak owns it, so it's our tower. Um, when we start, started the uh, Civic Center project, um, we knew the tower obviously wouldn't fit in the middle of our new park, so we had to come up with a new solution, and we looked everywhere. We looked at the senior housing, both on Williams and on uh, Troy Street. We looked at the fifth. We looked at um, just everywhere we could find for a better location, and, you know, of the, um, there really wasn't a good answer. Although the fifth seems like it's, wow, that looks just about as tall, it's not. It's much shorter, and you'd have to have the, the county needs 250 feet. And when I say the county, that's Royal Oak Police and Fire. It's Madison Heights Police and Fire. It's, we all use the same communication system. So we're on one communication system. Everybody relies on this, with, with, what is a regional asset. Everyone relies on it. And according to the county, they have to have 250 feet to provide both the coverage and the penetration in this area. So um, <clears throat> the, the county, the experts say that it's a, it's a necessity. So a 250-foot tower is going to go somewhere. And uh, I, I'm sure no one likes it. But um, so when we first started the project, um, the tower we own, AT&T rent space off our tower, called Brad. We said, hey, we're, we're looking about moving this tower. Um, and we all started looking at new solutions, and AT&T wanted to build on their property. Um, and uh, they offered, free of charge, to add an extra 100 feet to accommodate the public safety needs. So um, as opposed to the city <coughs> or the county building a brand new tower, because you can't move the tower, you have to build a whole new one, um, it seemed like a great solution. Uh, um, like I said, it's going to go somewhere. Um, originally, the ori very original plans had it behind the police station, the new police station, as kind of like a placeholder, but it really doesn't fit there. Um, and uh, I'm sure if we were here talking about it there, we'd have some people upset that that's where it's located. But um, I don't know if you have any more questions for me, but... Um, the existing red light on it, I believe, is uh, like a slow strobe. Yes. Um, is that what is thought that the FAA is going to require the same type of lighting, or we don't know? I'm no expert. I wouldn't think the change, if they made a change, I think they would apply e evenly everywhere. But the towers move, I would expect they'd have the exact same thing. It, but I, I, I don't know. Thank you. Mr. Kloster. Um, with, so... AT&T will own this new tower, and then will the city lease the use from AT&T? The county uh, will lease the space off it. The city won't, but the county <coughs> will because it's county equipment. Okay. And there was some talk about the tower in the back of the police station. Those are actually stacked. Those are two towers on top of each other. So that's not what they're talking about with this one. So and because this serves kind of regionally, there's not a proximity requirement where it needs to be within X number of feet of the police station? No, but the further it goes, the more you're paying for fiber to get get it there. Um, what I'm told is that w even though we moved it two blocks, it was there's licensing, there's coverage maps, there's things people do who this is their life um, to, to see if it works. They need a the county's convinced we need a tower near our downtown to provide the penetration in our downtown buildings that our guys need. So, Mr. Gasano, do you know what kind of equipment the county is going to want to put inside this compound? N well, we the system we currently have is at end of life, and over the next couple of years, it's spectacularly bad timing, but over the next couple of years, this, the county is transitioning to a new radio system. <clears throat> so we're gonna have to have probably the old equipment in first, and then the new equipment will go in later. Um, I don't have that, but I thought the county gave the specs from all that, didn't they? Yeah, they, they sent me drawings. Yeah, okay. If you're gonna speak, you'll have to come to the microphone. Um, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, they sent me drawings, but I just got them like yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to look at them. But AT&T Towers has all that information, and they're the ones that will be working with the county. 
So, so but there's some things like I think the building itself has a backup generator, so you don't need to have a backup. The system requires a backup generator, so there's some sort of condensing of, and it, you know, as everything gets smaller with the new technology. So I, I don't expect it to be as big, but we don't know right now, or I don't. Know. But the but are you saying the two the pieces of equipment that are right now sitting behind the police station in in that compound those will have to be originally moved over. Not all of it, but some of the towers will have to get moved over. Um, and it's actually, they have replica equipment. It's not that equipment, because you can't do it that way. They're going to have to put the new equipment in there and then switch them. Because the tower, this tower has to be up and running until the new tower is ready to switch over. You, you, you can't mm -hmm. lose that. Um, I'd also point out that, you know, finally our buildings are on track and, uh, we're supposed to complete the PD in June and move in, and we're moving in in July. And that tower is coming down in July. That's the plan, July and August. So we are kind of getting up against it time-wise. Do you happen to know what the lease arrangements are between the county and AT&T? Is, is it it's favorable. Years, 100 years? Or? I don't know what it is, but it, it, we got pretty good rates, if I recall correctly. But it's um, the county was pleased with it. it it's not a longevity issue in terms of a deal that they're making a deal with AT&T for X amount of years. Um, I don't know. I I was a pass through for the contract, but the county's happy with the contract and AT&T is happy with it. So it's between AT&T and the county. Okay. We don't have a role in it. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the chief or the petitioner? Ms. Beakey? I guess I'm hearing a couple unknowns here that I don't know if it's possible to know them before the final decision or if it's important, but I'll just raise the issue for my other, um, the other commissioners. Is the question on the lighting of what it would be, I kind of don't understand why we wouldn't already know that. Um, I, 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 I would, ex I'm sorry. Hey, hey, let me ask the second question too. And the, and the other one I would like to, and now I'm hearing is the fiber routing to the police, new police station, whether or not that's something we could be aware of is where's, what's going to be dug up or, or can that be laid where the work is being done now or, is that part of this we are issue? We are doing some of that. We're preparing in the areas we're working with, but it's going to have to get there. And I don't know if it needs to be dug up or there's existing conduits. That I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but that we'll have to connect to it. Because, again, returning to the opportunity of making improvements in the surface, if more things are going to be dug up near this box, it provides more opportunities for improvements, in my mind. Do you want an answer to your first question about the light? I mean, I, he said it's just go to the FAA regulations, which I assume right. is what he's going to say now. But yeah, yeah sure. Um, anytime you have a you filed with the FAA and there's an existing tower and there's any and there's ever a change in lighting requirements, the owner would be notified. So if the current tower here has not received any notification and that light is deemed acceptable, two blocks away. I can probably tell you 99% chance you're looking at the same lighting unless somebody has received the notification within the city or county, whomever owns this tower, and has completely disregarded it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's open up the public hearing then. Is any, would anybody like? To, yes, sir, right there. Just your name? The address. Name and address? <clears throat> My name is Frank Arvin. Um, I live at 326 East Fifth Street, just so you know. And I'm on the downtown uh, park committee. Um, when the uh, current tower went up, it was an eyesore at the time, and nobody liked it, I'm sure. And we understand fully that there is a requirement for communication, and I know that it's a complicated situation. But putting a tower in the middle of our downtown, almost at the heart of our downtown, 4th and Main, <clears throat> seems to be uh, a way of not improving the downtown, which we've been trying to do over the past 10, 15 years with dramatic effect with our park and so forth. And so I'm not in favor of putting the tower in that location. It seems that near the police station, the new police station, makes more sense. It pulls it out of a central point in town and keeps it from becoming a focus of our downtown. Um, also, it's next to the police station, so it can be secured. It seems to be a little bit better and more protected. The, it seems the uh, 
Fiber optics don't have to go as far, so there seems to be savings. I suspect that the reason it's where it is is because there is a good deal by AT&T <clears throat> who wants to build a tower there, and so, you know, <laughs> we're getting AT&T to build the tower, and uh, that's a, a good thing in terms of economics. But it doesn't really improve our downtown. That parking lot has been an eyesore since I moved here in 1997. And if it can't be moved to another location, then I would suspect, I would hope that this commission would uh, push very hard to improve that, that area with landscaping and so forth. Barring that, it seems to me that that is a prime development lot that if a tower goes there, it will not be developed in the next 30 years for anything other than what it is. And that would be a shame because that is a beautiful location for some future project. So I would hope that you would take all these things into account and you would study it a little more and make sure that we're getting the best situation we can. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Razor. Thank you, Chairman, or Chairwoman, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Razor, 201 East 4th. Um, we're directly affected. We're right across the street. So, Madam Chair, if I could have a little bit of latitude with time, I'd appreciate it. But I'll try to be as quickly as I can. The standard to make this decision is, uh, number one, will it be harmonious and in accordance with the general objectives or any specific objectives of the master plan? Uh, no, not at all. The master plan for this area is CBD. Uh, CBD is uh, uh, not that. Uh, these areas, I'm quoting from the master plan, are intended to promote the downtown as a special business area offering a range of convenience, convenient retail shops, personal services, restaurants, and other uses. Imagine for a second, this is what I was thinking, if I came and said, hey, I want a cell phone tower at Razor Law, in a heartbeat you guys would say no. That's the downtown, it's a gorgeous building, it's built in the 20s, we'll never do that. Of course not. Nobody would allow a cell phone tower in their CBD. The only reason that I think anybody would ever want to consider this is because we all like the chief and we all support the cops. That's the only reason that this has any attraction at all, is because it's municipal, because it helps us, it saves us money. But do we know how much money it saves us? I don't. I don't know if we're getting a 99-year lease for free on the tower. It doesn't sound like we are. I don't know how much the fiber optics are costing to run from the police station over to Maine or over to Williams and Forth. Does that offset the cost of us building our own tower? What happens if the leasee, and at and is not building this, Fortune Wireless is building this, this is lease space, and this generates a lot of money. According to the people I've talked to today, this is twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, forty a year. It, what if this leasee decides they don't want the tower anymore and we've run the fiber optics? I mean, there are so many questions. And having sat in your seats, I appreciate you coming here and I know the responsibility on you, but not only are you putting or allowing or thinking of allowing a use which is completely inconsistent with the downtown, right in the middle of the downtown, because I agree with Mr. Arvin, 4th and Main is kind of pretty much the epicenter, I think. But you're putting it in a place where it's across the street from, you know, my office building built in 19, uh, 1924 and kind of lovingly restored and a lot of other things that we're trying to bring up to a, a certain level. And then you've got this monstrosity and then they say, well, we can't disguise it because it would look even worse. Come on, a 150 foot galvanized tower, 250 foot, I'm sorry. I looked today on, on skyscraper.net this thing is taller than the train station in Corktown. This thing is taller than the fifth. It's been three minutes, Mr. Reagan. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, may I have uh, a little bit more? I am directly affected. Planning Commission? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. A minute. It's taller than the train station downtown. It's the tallest structure in town, and it's going to be this ugly galvanized thing that we're going to look at for God knows how long. Like, we can't go back to the drawing board on this, and at least if it's going to go there, First of all, I agree with Mr. Arvin. That property should be massively improved. There's a big corner section there. We could do a bike thing there. We could do a little pocket park there. We could do landscaping on the site. We could do great fencing. And I know this is running up your guys' tab. 
But we could also do a camouflage tower. I went today on, um, looked at camouflaged cell phone towers online for a little bit. They have them that are 250 feet tall. They're perfectly camouflaged. They can make them into all sorts of things, clock towers and all sorts of weird stuff. But just an ugly thing there, no way. And even to look at the second criteria. Four minutes, Mr. Razor. Thank you. Will be designed, constructed, and maintained so as to be harmonious and appropriate in appearance with an existed or intended character of the general vicinity and will not change the, the character of the general vicinity. This is a deal breaker. This is a municipal thing. You wouldn't be considering it if it didn't have a municipal component. Put it in the new municipal lot that we're developing. We have a whole municipal complex. That's where it belongs. I mean, unless somebody can show me that we're saving millions, tens of millions of dollars, I'm, I don't know what we're saving. I mean. Thank you, Mr. Razor. Appreciate it. Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Planning commissioners, thank you for all you do. Anybody else? Yes. Your name, please. Good evening. Alex Schneider, 1011 Knowles. I live by the cell tower right across from me. <clears throat> it's owned by a different company, but the nature of the business is the same, and the nature of the operation is the same. And <clears throat> I can report to you what I see on a regular basis. Um, there is no way of telling who is going to sublease the space there and what buildings are they going to build in the future. Sometimes when they come in and do something across the street from me, no permits are displayed or issued. Things are done without permits. I had to beg for years to get landscaping. Um, because they didn't want to do it. Um, so if anything is going to be done on that side, the tower needs to be aesthetically appealing. Um, landscaping needs to be installed and also needs to be a provision that if any other buildings are going to go in there, it needs to be with an approval or equipment, I should um, underline, buildings or equipment needs to be within, within the approval from the city of Royal Oak. Also, uh, I was hearing about vinyl um, fans. What's wrong with the brick wall? at and has got money. There's nothing wrong with the brick wall. We need to beautify the, the space downtown. We need to think about it in advance. Because once it's approved, there is no way back. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, now soon we'll close the public hearing. Let's bring it back to this side for more discussion. Any other questions? Ms. Douglas. I'd like to hear back from the chief again on the idea that we might put this um, on the new municipal site. Um. Like I said, originally it was, um, we kind of put a placeholder behind the police department where the news, but mm -hmm. I think the people who live on Phillips, the people who live on 11 Mile would all have the same concerns. Um, you know, it's not, towers are ugly, I get it, but moving the existing tower basically two blocks is all we're doing. But is there, is there space? I mean, is, could it be put there? I don't. Uh, we moved forward on the design without it being there because we thought this was a great solution. So um, could there be space? Yeah, there probably could be space, but it would not be easy and would have to sacrifice things we've already bored with, whether it's some parking in the back or, or things like that. So it would be, it's a very, very tight fit back there. But possible. Possible, yes. And so, if that were the case, I mean, someone made the point that this is a, you know, revenue, it's a, you know, they're landlords, this is a revenue generator. If the city were to build the tower, would we then um, obtain, you know, attain that revenue for the other people who are using it? Do we, we do that now? We do that now. Right. And it's not much. Maybe we're not great negotiators, we don't get a good deal, but it, it was not a significant amount of money. 
compared to how much we're gonna, it's going to cost us to build a 250-foot tower. We had it budgeted for a million dollars. Well, but so. the other company's going to build it. I mean, the, the city wouldn't build it. To well, I don't think they're building it if they don't own it. They're only building it if it's on their property. They weren't going to build it if it's not on their property. When it was on their property and it's their tower, that's why they're willing to build it. So, um, all right. Carry on. Mr. Godek? Um, that's the basic conflict that I have with this is uh, um, there's not an ideal site anywhere. And um, the fact that you're getting it built is a struggle because I can't require them to make it look the way we want it to. Um, just looking at some photos online of, of cell tower or uh, design, uh, we could make it look great um, if, if we could invest some money into it. But to try to require someone that's building it for you uh, to make the first 50 feet of it look like a clock tower might be something aesthetically nice and satisfy the people that have to look at it every day or deal with it. <clears throat> so that, that's what I'm struggling with. If, if we could add some aesthetics to this design instead of dragging their feet through trying to get some plantings and, um, and, and make the lot look nice, um, we could take this even a step further. But <clears throat> we're limited. We can't. I, I, I'm struggling with trying to make those kind of suggestions for someone that's building it for us. So that's where I'm having a problem and like to hear how the other commissioners feel. I have some questions or concerns too. So um, did we have it in our original budget when the police station was budgeted to put the tower in ourselves? Yes. And it was a million dollars? Do you know how long it would take us to recoup that if we were to build the tower ourselves and then sell the space um, back I, to at and or other vendors? I, I'm going off. I, I don't know. I think we we're just paying. We we're just making like 20 grand a year off that tower. So it would take some time. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't think it would come close to it. Well, well, and if I can comment on the plan for the Civic Center, the, the police chief commented on the police station. Um, I, I believe it would be difficult to locate this tower where it was held uh, as a placeholder on those plans at this point, given uh, the plans that were ultimately approved. This body actually saw the police station plans. Um, there is a parking lot that's behind it for police vehicles, uh, and a portion of that at one point was talked about for the tower, but that would put it in close proximity to the residents of Phillips. And, um, but if you took out a 40 by 50 swap in order to build this exact same thing over there, you're going to wipe that parking lot out pretty much and, 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 and wipe out at least... Uh, a lot of the parking on it. So, and, and then looking at the rest of the site for City Hall and the uh, Farmer's Market area, I, I keep in mind that if the idea was that it should go over there, you're going to eliminate something else that's over there. And, 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 and so I, I just want to make that commentary. Yes, it was looked at, uh, and I know the Chief spent a lot of time dealing with AT&T and things, but it was on earlier plans to go behind the police station and given I think it's proximity to residents and some other issues over there that it was taken out um, mm -hmm. and, and it, I think it would be difficult at this point to say you're going to move it back over there at this point <clears throat> Okay. But that's not to say what you do with this site <laughs> no, I appreciate your comments Mr. Twain Mr. Godek. Uh, is there an opportunity <coughs> to um, take that money that was mentioned that we were going to have to spend to build a tower and do some sort of uh, co-ownership kind of arrangement with this site? Well, let me, let, me, let me say this. The planning, depart or the planning commission has no role in financial as aspects of any of this. That's right. not any of your consideration. 
your consideration is, is this an appropriate site under the special land use to allow this tower and its facilities? And if that's the case, then you would make a motion to approve the special land use. Um, then when you go to the site plan, if you want the wrought iron fencing, if you want the vinyl fencing, if you want uh, improvements to it as part of the site plan, you would tell the petitioner what they have to put in. Who pays for it is not your concern. That said, Can no. I ask the city no. manager? <laughs> no, because when we had a budget, um, that's kind of was early on we took it out. Right. But so now, you know, the, the cost of the delays and steel and things like that, that ate that up. So there's not an extra million dollars sitting there. But if we weren't if we weren't to approve this location, you'd be back on municipal property and looking for that million dollars again. Well, like if you don't approve this location, like I was asked, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. It not without long delays. So you're going to have your park is going to get delayed because the buildings can't come down until a replacement is up and running. And at this point, I don't know that there's time to go back to the drawing board. I mean, we could, but then <coughs> the, our park's getting delayed by a year, and the city buildings have to be up and running to power the tower. So, okay, thank you. Any other questions for the um, chief or the petitioner? Yes. Yeah, I have a Ms. question Clifford. for the petitioner. The is there anything on the existing site that, the, or the proposed site, I should say, that is mandating the location of this enclosure, this 40 by 50 that is 30 feet plus or minus from the property line as opposed to something further into the site. Further, you mean into the middle of the parking lot? Correct. For, well, further away from the streets, Williams and Forth. I mean, if you look, we're, we're nearly caddy quarter in, in between those buildings. There's really not much more we can do that's probably um, I guess 15 20 feet I'm not quite sure what the main concern would be as I said if structurally it's highly unlikely that it would collapse and if it does it would fall within a 20 foot radius the closer you start getting in the buildings that 20 foot radius starts getting close to the buildings um, and then you have a tower right in the middle of a, a parking lot that's AT&T's property which disrupts their current use as well. Um, I'm actually thinking more towards the, the south. So you're kind of like dead center in that. It looks like it's two lots that are combined. You're kind of like dead center in that. That's a building directly east, and then there's a building directly south as the AT&T building. Correct. And this so, enclosure is about dead center between the sidewalk and the building to the south. And is there a door or something there? Any reason? No, but if you if you look, Sam, if you could put your right on that, that's a drain, so we can't go over the drain. Ah, easement. That's a problem. I mean, we we placed it as far south as we can place it. Oh, circle. Any other questions for the petitioner? Is there a motion? Again, you've got the special land use first. Mr. Casada. I, I would just like to have a little discussion, if, if we can continue that. I don't want to take too much time. Okay, so there is a tower already in downtown, and it's tucked behind the police station, and it's behind the driveway, and it's really, really ugly, but people don't see it. This, to move it here, this is a very visible site. It's open right now. There's only a chain link fence. So it's really not the 250 feet that I think I'm worried about because there already is a tower. It's the lower part that now is suddenly going to be very visible. And I think that it, there was a lot of good points made here. I don't think uh, one of the criteria is not the finances with, uh, with the city. So I'm a little, uh, I'm a little shy about including that into my calculation, there is, uh, number six is will not create excessive costs, but that's, that's not what's happening here. 
we're, we're, we're thinking about how do we save the city cost. That's not a criteria. So I, I'm, I'm shy about doing that. I don't think it's uh, particularly uh, harmonious. I do think uh, there's some detriments for future use. Uh, but on the other hand, what we're, we have discretion here to grant, if I, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, we have discretion to say, okay, special land use granted. But then we go to the site plan, we also have some discretion to say what landscaping is required. And I don't know how much limitation we have in that. I would be inclined to be very aggressive about asking for the landscaping, even to the point of asking for that chain link fence to be pulled in on a triangle and have the corner be some sort of a, a, public, a publicly accessible landscaped area. So I'm thinking that that might be one route to take. In other words, grant, vote for the special land use, and then we'll worry about the landscaping when we get to the site plan. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Ms. Beagie? Again, given the visibility and the location, and again, accepting that we do have to have a tower, I feel, I feel pretty strongly in agreement that not just landscaping, but there must be something aesthetically that can be done so that the lower, if we call it the three stories that you see when you're walking, it's about a three-story aspect that is the one that's going to be in your sight line. Again, the AT&T is already a bunker there with a the chain link fence. It's been sad for a long time. So again, this is an opportunity to both grant this use, which is very important, but to again, given the location and its prominence, to also expect something very nice looking there and usable by the community as they come by, not just something that's blocked off. Ms. Douglas and Mr. Godek. I'm gonna move uh, approval of the uh, special land use. I mean, we should have a motion on the table to discuss this further. I agree. So I'm gonna make support. that motion. Is there support? Support, support special land use. Support by Mr. Kluster. So uh, no discussion. looking at the, the basis for determination, I mean, the, you know, what the uh, zoning ordinance says, the conditions that have to be met, I can't say that, I mean, I, I see that this tower kind of falls outside a lot of those conditions. But we as a, a city, as a c part of the community, have an obligation to preserve the safety of our people and, you know, our neighboring communities. Um, and I just, I think there is, we have a role to play here. I, I absolutely agree that when we get to talking about, you know, the site plan, gloves are off. But I think essentially, uh, and, and I'm satisfied that our staff, our chief, and I'm sure our uh, legal department um, have done the due diligence on this and have, uh, I'm satisfied that they have ruled out any other possible locations, and I'm going to accept the fact that this is their only option. So I'm going to make the motion and vote for it. Any other discussion on this motion? Mr. Godin. Uh, I, I know we're discussing that motion, but um, I, I wanted to give, because this motion has to happen first, I understand that as well. <laughs> However, uh, I did agree with uh, Mr. Casada and Ann's comments about um, being aggressive with what we go to with the site plan, and I'll just leave it at that. I said that too. Hmm. We agree. Yeah. Any other discussion on this motion? I'm assuming it's with permission to seek the variances. Yes, thank you. That's what I said. Okay, not seeing any other hands. Uh, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of, the, of uh, moving forward the special land use, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the special land use has moved forward, and now we're on to the site plan. Mr. Twing, is there anything you'd like to add? No, uh, the only things I heard is they've, they've offered a final fence at eight feet around the equipment and a wrought iron fence around the perimeter. <clears throat> uh, there is no landscaping shown, so... Uh, anything you'd want, you'd have to tell us what you're looking for. Ms. Douglas and Mr. Godek. So I quickly glanced at um, 77090, um, and it, I mean, you know, I'm not steeped in that as I'm sure Mr. Twing is. Um, uh, there are, the zoning ordinance does describe certain common elements that we need in terms of screening. 
for example, a three-foot masonry screening wall or combinations of landscaping or whatever. How much leeway do we really have in requiring more than what is articulated in the zoning ordinance? Um, under a special land use, if you think it's mitigating a detrimental impact to the area, you've got pretty wide discretion in the sense of, of requiring width or height or things if you're talking you know, six foot hedgerow of arborvitaes or something, you certainly could require it if it's on a basis again of mitigating what you see as a, a an impact. So those would, and it could be a combination of the wrought iron fence that's been offered and landscaping and, and you want a five foot or six foot landscape area around the exterior of the perimeter. Well, Ms. Beeky is nighting her head vigorously, so I'm going to yield the floor to Commissioner Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Was he waiting? I'm interested in hearing what other commissioners have to say on this subject. Bodek was next. Uh, um, uh, I'll go after Ann. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I guess, again, listening to what I've heard from the, from the community that spoke up, listening to our discussion, considering the fact that we need to have this and now we're agreeing it can be in this location, and then turning to our... our um, master plan and some of the language that's been commented on here and thinking of something that would be harmonious and appropriate, I is if it's appropriate, I'd like to hear the petitioners come back to us, give them some time to think and review, having just seen that site today, and really think about how they can make that work for that downtown area, because we would like it to work. We know we need it, but we also would like it to be something that for our neighbors and for the community downtown that they don't feel appalled. Um, I'm not sure about the protocol on that. You have to refer to her. But so that I would like to see that go back to them so they can make those, rather than us trying to come up with things on the fly. That's where I'm at right now. Well, you can, you can table it and postpone it, tell them to bring the site plan back with revisions, but I think you're going to want to give them a message that, yeah. of what you want to see rather than just go do something and come back. Otherwise, we're really not making any progress. More specific, okay. Um, so I, I don't, if you're concerned about something in specific, that's fine. You can postpone it until next month, and they'll have an opportunity to make some revision. But please give them some direction, because we're not, we're not going right. to know what you're looking for. Mr. Godek and then Mr. Kluster. <clears throat> um, as far as I agree with everything that's been stated so far, and I think it's a good idea to ask the petitioner to, to bring something back. And if I had a wish list, it would uh, include um, a 10-foot uh, fence of either wood or masonry around the structures. Um, and uh, I'm going to go back to some photos that I'm seeing. And, and uh, you know, even if they're AT&T colors of, of white and blue, panels that could go into the first 50 feet of the structure from the ground up in an appealing way. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some, you know, the structure itself basically retains the same uh, grid pattern, but you just have some panels that go in there, every other one. Um, some of those ideas. Now, there's other ways to camouflage a tower than make it look like a tree um, for the first so many feet of it because that's what people are going to see. And, um, you know, if there are some workable ideas like that, you, you guys that build those towers might have better ideas than I can articulate right now. Um, and it could be appealing to AT&T as well. Um, maybe it has a small logo of theirs on it. Um, that would be a good trade for making this thing look less like a tower for what people have to see. You know, leave it at that. Mr. Kluster? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, echo some of the comments that I, I think we need to see something come back. Um, I don't think we can do a landscape plan for them. I think they need to do a landscape plan and bring it back. Um, uh, some, some guidance, I think, mm -hmm. for asking them to come back. Um, the the drain in question is uh, it appears to be a parking lot surface drain. So, it's if you're making it uh, permeable, then I, I don't see that being an issue. You have a proposed 
easement going through that area. Um, so uh, anything that's in there can w uh, be moved, especially if you're adding a new easement. Um, so it's it's a utility tower. Um, it's something that's utilitarian and needed for the public safety in our city and the surrounding communities. I see the need for it. Um, that's why I'm supporting the special land use. I don't. It's it, it's something that's utilitarian. I think trying to beautify it doesn't necess necessarily achieve that goal. I think your best bet is to tuck it away best you can and make the surrounding areas harmonious with the intent of the master plan, harmonious with the character of the surrounding uh, community, um, and getting it as far away from the street as possible provides that opportunity. Um, so I, I would like to see efforts made to relocate the tower and come back with a plan that adds landscaping and provides opportunity for future development. Mr. Casana? Well, it's AT&T's property. Just to respond to that, it's AT&T's property. Uh, they've decided at this point not to develop it, to put the tower there. Um, I think the comment we heard from one of the, uh, the public was, once you do this, it's not going to be developed, and I think that's probably correct. So if I was going to characterize what I would be looking for, I would be, and this is maybe a little, it's not very specific, but I would be looking for something for the petitioner to come back with. This was a significant park-like landscaping with trees that would be higher to block that and that people would walk by it and say, wow, that's the best trade-off we've ever made, mm -hmm. the tower for that park. That's what I would like. Ms. Douglas. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to the challenges of um, uh, maintaining landscaping. Mr. Casada mentioned trees. We in the city have a very aggressive program about planting trees. Um, over time, they would screen that. So, I mean, as, as we give suggestions to the um, to the owners, I would say I like trees. I like the idea of a permeable surface. If you're only parking four cars there, um, you only need enough pavement to park a minimal number of cars. You could go with um, the the permeable surface where grass grows up through the you know the the plastic interlocking thing. Um, I'm and I'm looking for some public benefit here for you know what we've granted. Um, I'm not. I'm. I think I'm with Mr. Kluster. The idea of trying to hide the tower. I I think that's isn't going to fool anybody. Um, but we definitely want a, a you know eight or a ten foot enclosure around that. Um, I could live with vinyl. I'd love masonry or brick. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. So I'm going to I'll make a few comments. Um, I I really appreciate the ideas from Mr. Casana and, and Ms. Douglas. I think. I, I do not agree that we're going to be able to hide this tower. I do not agree that you should put a giant sequoia there in the middle of our city. It would look ridiculous. West Bloomfield did it, and it's very silly. Um, I think the idea of making this a, a placemaking opportunity so people's eyes aren't going to be staring up at the tower, but they're, they're going to be uh, fixated on what that corner could look like. If you're not going to develop this corner, which clearly you're not, um, then there's going to be an opportunity to, to take down that armored fence and create some masonry uh, components, um, some placemaking opportunities for people to, to sit and enjoy and actually come there and, and relax in that specific corner area. So I don't, you know, it's your property. I don't know what the rules are for AT&T, but there could be some real opportunity for you to, to do something there other than just a hot pavement with a chain link fence and a tower. Those are my comments. Would you like to, you're welcome to come back up and. Sure. Great ideas all. <clears throat> we can't make any decisions, of course. That's going to be AT&T corporate. <clears throat> and I can tell you this. They can get by with a 150-foot tower, a monopole tower. We're doing this because the city and the county needs it. So I would ask, can the city and the county contribute? Ask that guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> no. We can't either. We can't either because we don't have so, control. The I mean, 
we can put up all kinds of wrought iron and masonry, but every time you, you know, it, it's all about money at that point. How much money can AT&T spend on this and still have a good business plan? So uh, that's, you know, we'll take it back if we're going to continue sign. this and table it for a month, two weeks, whatever. Uh, we'll take it back to corporate. Oh, we appreciate that, and I would just only say this, uh, that I understand there's money issues that you guys are dealing with, and the, and the, but if you brought a 150-foot tower to this commission, we would have had the same discussion. No, probably not. Oh, yeah. I mean, because it, it would have been a monopole, just a straight tower. This is a big self-support tower. So, or we could go on top of the roof. You know, I'm just trying to... We really want to help the city out. That's why we're doing this, not us. I, I don't have a, I don't have anything in the game here. And we, I, you know what? To that extent, we really appreciate it. We do. Or to wireless is building and going to own it. Man, I wish, <laughs> but I'm just a poor boy from Indianapolis. We don't have that much money. <laughs> so, I'll take this back to AT and T corporate. I'll have a meeting with them tomorrow, and if if we can get some extension, then I'll start feeding Tim. You know different plans and maybe you could pass those around before we come back what's the pleasure of the commission a um, motion uh, make a motion to um, postpone this decision or postpone postpone this item um, I mean I'm not inclined to paint them into a corner to have to bring something back in a month unless they want to um, I mean I'd rather give them time to do it right so I would say postpone this till November or sooner. Is there support? Mm -hmm. Unless you want to act faster than that. Well, why don't you just postpone it until they have a plan that's ready postpone. to submit? Okay. And that way, postpone it. Postpone it. Postpone it. So the motion is to postpone. Is there support? Support. Support by. Give it to Cassana. I'm going to pick Mr. Cassana. <laughs> okay. Any discussion on on this motion to postpone? Not seeing all those in favor. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion to postpone was approved. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> okay. Okay, the next um, number two is also a public hearing. This is a conditional rezoning from one family residential to mixed use one and site plan. Uh, this is to construct a 51 multiple family dwelling units in seven four-story buildings. The Epic at Harrison, at northeast corner of Knoll Street, <coughs> pardon me, in East Harrison Avenue. Mr. Twain. Well, let me get it up here first. Well, if, they're, if they want to go through their presentation first, why don't you let them in and I'll walk through the deviations if they're ready. Yeah, that's true. That's fine. Did you Introduce you yourself, please. My name is Alex Bogarts. I'm the architect for the petitioner. And I'd like to uh, begin by uh, giving the commission a perspective into the strength and commitment uh, Robert Wolfson has to developments within the Royal Oak community. Uh, Bob has developed Main Street lofts, Center Street lofts, Town Street lofts, and the Harrison Apartment Project in Royal Oak. This newest project he'll, will be his fifth in Royal Oak, and, and that is a significant accomplishment for any developer, and particularly so when you consider that the quality and the, that each of those have brought to the community. Um, this new proposal, the Epic at Harrison, seeks to continue the previously approved uh, conditional rezoning. However, we have a substantially different proposal for you this evening. The prior project had 76 apartments in a typical corridor style building with, detach, with detached garages, with many detached garages immediately uh, on the north and east property lines. We now propose 51 units. That's 25 fewer units than, than previously approved. Uh, there are several benefits with this new proposal that will, will could not potentially be achieved uh, under existing zonings, and it vastly improves over the prior project. 
some of those benefits are uh, we now propose a luxury townhouse for sale neighborhood development. This, this is a benefit to the community because simply homeowners have a different perspective on ownership that other occupancies uh, of housing may not. I, I can tell you certainly from in the neighborhood I live in, I find myself, I'm a homeowner, and I find myself picking up things that are on the street and so forth, and, and I've seen my neighbors do the same thing, and maybe even uh, the commission has had a like experience. But that, that is a different mindset. That's the type of mindset you have when, there, when it's ownership over rental properties. So we believe that this converting to a for sale product is, is a significant benefit to the community. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the density drop from 76 to 51 is 13 units uh, fewer. And that brings it another benefit to the community in terms that you reduce the number of uh, trips per day uh, and street traffic, and you reduce the uh, move-ins and move-outs that you might classically see in an apartment development. Each, town, each of these townhomes uh, will have a private two-car garage. An attached garage home is simply a more uh, secure format of and lifestyle. Fewer units further reduces the burden on emergency vehicles and cause for the community services. I'd like to speak just a moment about the unit, or, unit orientation within these buildings. We have a, a long both along Knowles and Harrison, we have our buildings have a front door on them that will have a walkway out to the sidewalk. Also on the other side of the building that is in the motor court, there will as well be a door accessing the unit and a door accessing into the garage. Now this gives you an opportunity for a kind of a classic home lifestyle where you come home and you drop pull in the garage and then you move through your garage to go into the unit and if you have guests come and visit you, they classically will park in the street and come to your front door. So we have we see that as a very similar uh, a lifestyle here. <clears throat> One of the things I want to point out and really want to make an effort to, to speak to is that this is a luxury development. Um, and that's realized in many, many different things. Certainly one having a two-car attached garage, but also in having um, terraces on these units that we've committed to in design that are different from a, just a typical cantilevered five foot by eight foot balcony you quite often see in for sale product. <clears throat> these balconies are going to be the full width of the unit and they'll reach as much as seven to eight feet deep and 17 feet wide. It's a major uh, terrace and a wonderful living, living opportunity for the people that acquire these, these units. Additionally, we've we've made a great effort to to uh, be be considerate of our neighbors to the north and east. Uh, we have a developed a whole a building st style here that steps back as it goes vertically, and in so doing, that gives us a a great uh, opportunity for op open space as you get up to the highest floor. Um, another thing we've done is by bringing forth this new proposal to the community where we have taken out all the garages that were immediately on the north and, and east property lines, we now save 11 major trees that are there. In addition to that, we have a, an extensive landscaping now because our buildings are set 20 feet away from the property line. And in that 20 feet, we have walks and some major uh, landscape plan that will be, will be shown to you in a moment. Um, <coughs> Further, uh, we've made a, an effort in the site to, to create a sustainable site. Uh, for the stormwater control, uh, we've provided uh, green infrastructure to our stormwater design, incorporating bioswells into the project and on the northeast corner. Now, an interesting thing to, to, for the commission to, to consider here and, and understand is that the prior property, had a prior proposal, at 122,000 square feet of area on it. We are now at 82,000 square feet with all of our 
units and garages. That's a significant reduction, and we think a, uh, a great um, format for the community to consider this uh, this uh, for sale product here on this property as as, a, as an alternative to the previously approved apartment project. I'd like to ask Mark Abernathy, who is one of our senior vice presidents and a registered architect. He has a lot of detail that we can go over with on the project, and uh, I'll bring, ask Mark to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the commission. I'm going to put a couple boards up uh, as I present. Tim, could you go to the, you had it up first, the overall site context? It's taking a minute. It's going slow tonight for some reason. All right. I've got a board. That this I one? <laughs> So I just wanted to briefly discuss site context for the project and how it relates to what's going on around it. Something when we start a project, we look at all of that. We look at what's on the site and we look at what's going on around it because all of that starts to dictate the design and the respect of the site and the respect of the neighbors. So when you look at Harrison right here and then you look at Maine, as you come across Harrison, starting right at the corner of Maine and Harrison's mixed-use building, then you come into the impound lot and then this large, I call it industrial recycle center, and then our site. Once again, starting on Maine and Harrison, you have all multiple family here, retail. As you come down, you have multiple family here, and then you get to the project that I'll talk about that's on the south side of Harrison, uh, the wonderful project that Bob redid from the lumber yard. So the context of everything going on on Harrison is either industrial, recycle, commercial, or multiple family. And then as you get east and to the north of the property, you have single family. So we looked at this and we looked at the original project and, and where we're at now, and we have a wonderful transition in going to an attached townhouse project. And I'll get into the architecture itself. Alex touched on it, how the buildings step away from the property line, how from the previous project we've moved from having garages that fronted right on the property line that really didn't lend as much green belt or separation between the existing single family and ours, and how we've terraced those buildings. This is another study that we did to try and show context from the standpoint of our project and our buildings. To the north, we have a wide variety of um, dimensions shown here, but predominantly what I want to show is this 160 foot to 177 foot of separation between the homes at the rear to our buildings. And then that's all along the north property line. And then as you get to the east property line, there's some 90 feet here, a little over 70, and around 80 feet here. So there's quite a bit of separation, but you can see right here it's not shown in green. All of this area now is landscape area where before there were garages that were right up against the property line. This study was also done to show context and what we've done relative to the other project. Here's the property line here. This is basically our closest point, which is buildings four and five, where we have the property line. Then essentially this 10 foot setback that's shown here is where this building could have been put that's shaded in. In other words, we could put a three story building that's 30 feet high right here, right up against the property line, 10 feet away. And instead of, and before, the other project had garages right here. And instead what we did was we kept a 20-foot green belt back to here, and then we've stepped the building up. This is actually a screen wall that's on the end, so 
The terrace that Alex was talking about is right here. Then as we progressed up on our next two levels of the unit, then we stepped back to 27 <coughs> feet here. And when we get up to the uppermost bedroom area, where if you look at the formula and you add two foot for every additional foot, where we're supposed to be 30 feet when we get up to that fourth floor bedroom, we're actually 34 feet here. So we've gone out of our way to try and terrace this building up to take advantage of that from the standpoint of the lifestyle of the units. We have dual large terraces, a large one at the main living level, and then another large one up at this master bedroom area. So we really think that it's an excellent when you look at what's going on here from the standpoint of the setbacks to the single family. And when you look at this in terms of the step of the building, that we really meet the spirit and the intent of what the ordinance is trying to do with that formula of setting the building back. So we're trying to respect our neighbors, but we also have privacy that we want to have on, on our side. We want our residents to have a sense of privacy when they're on those terraces as well as single family. And I'll point out here, when you look at this aerial, you see the amount of forestation or trees that are on the single family. And as Alex mentioned, some 11 existing trees here. And when you look at our landscape plan, I don't have a hand, uh, copy of it here, but I'm sure Tim does. We've added a significant number of deciduous and pines all along this property line. So between the existing trees that are on the north and on the east, and all of the landscape that we've added and saved. We've also put a six foot high wood fence that's going to be along here. You can see that right here. And this kind of shows the scale of some of the existing trees. You're gonna have a good deal of visual buffer and privacy between the single family, between what's on our site and what's on these existing single families, plus just the angle and the distance. There's a real good buffer and separation between the two buildings. One thing that I did want to mention that I didn't when we were talking about the height of the building, the original building that was designed, which was approved, was much larger and much more massive and spanned virtually the entire east-west dimension. And that building was 37 feet high, all at one level. I just wanted to put that out there to show some context of what we've done. And we've changed that by that terracing. This terracing that takes place here also occurs out at Harrison. So we're not only looking at human scale and interest on the rear of the building that is on the north property line and is on the east property line, but we've done the same thing out at Harrison. So when you look at this rendering, I'm going to jump around, but it's important. <clears throat> the streetscape that is out along Harrison is terrace from, you can see the upper terrace here at the master uh, owner suite and then down here at the main living area. And then this is the streetscape as you come along Harrison so that the building steps away from you and you have a sense of human scale with the streetscape of existing trees and then the walks that are going to come to each one of those private entrances that are along Harrison out to the public walk. So you don't have the mass of, we didn't just take the same thing that we did at the back, this example where you could have a vertical 30 foot high wall, we didn't place that building like that right out at the streetscape. We tried to create a lot of interest along that streetscape. This is another sense of context. The building that is on the left, this is what used to be, or what is now the Harrison, and what, yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so this, this is the project that Bob did that's on the south side of Harrison that was at one point in time that original lumber yard, and you all remember what the building was like, but I'm going to walk you through some existing photos of that before and after. And you can see what it looks like in relationship to the new project. Similar materials, similar large panels of glass, similar um, 
uh, stucco and or ephus along with accents of wood with strong masonry bands. You can see the landscaping, the grasses will be similar and the trees. So these projects will really bookend themselves and just be a beautiful streetscape on both the north and the south side of Harrison. A quick before and after some photos. You can see where this project was before, just a masonry block building, large sea of asphalt, and now you can see the project as it sits. And if you envision this and then envision what we're proposing to do now, that whole streetscape will just be beautiful as you go east-west on Harrison. What we wanted to represent with this slide was basically to show that a lot of typical multiple family projects, when you look at the outdoor living space or private terrace area that you see on the majority of the projects, they look like this, simple 5 by 10s or 5 by 8s or 5 by 12s stuck on the building. You can see how, as we've discussed, we've integrated that living space and made it a design feature and a large area for the residents that live in those units to go out and recreate. And something that's a major statement that's part of the building, but also creates that layering and that sense of privacy and human scale. And lastly, with this slide, basically what we wanted to do, one of the comments that was in the review letter um, in terms of what the staff could not support was in this clear vision triangle that was on the corner of Knowles and Harrison was where we originally had a ground sign. And what we've decided to do is similar to Bob's project across the street where he has letters that are up at the main entrance that say the Harrison. We're going to pin mount the build, uh, letters for the signage, letters only on the side of the building, and then have them slightly raised, pin mounted with a little bit of backlighting to them, so that the, the elegance of the signage on the project will be out of the clear vision triangle and match what's going on across the street. That's mainly what I wanted to go through. Um, I know Bob himself wanted to end our presentation with a couple of comments. So I'm sorry, to be clear, you eliminated the monument sign? That's correct. Okay. I'm Robert Wolfson and I live in in the city at five ninety East Harrison and I've kinda of lived here for ten years out of the last fourteen years. Um, pretty much covered everything I was gonna tell you, but I would like to say this isn't just a luxury project. It is significantly less than most of the ones that were built years ago in costs. Um, but it still gets to a different, it attracts, I think, the same kind of market we have now. It's a little more upscale looking, I believe. Um, and, um, and it does have the ability for people to have more children than they would, let's say, in the Harrison apart apartments that we did. Um, other than that, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to do another project in the city. And um, that's about all I can tell. Unless you have any questions, obviously, I would like to try to answer them. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Did you want to hear from Mr. Twain first? Okay. Sure. I'll go through it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a request for a conditional rezoning. As the petitioner indicated, uh, uh, I believe in 2017, uh, they had received a, a, a conditional rezoning at that time as well um, for a different project. It still was a, 
a residential project, but it was determined uh, by staff and discussion that uh, the proposal in front of you was significantly enough different to not treat it under that same conditional rezoning. So it is in back in front of you. Um, and I can highlight some of the differences uh, between that project and this one in a minute. Uh, but again, this one um, is a conditional rezoning, so you are providing a recommendation to the City Commission in regards to this project. So the final decision uh, won't be this evening. It'll be uh, when it gets to the Commission. They are proposing uh, 51 residential units uh, as compared to the prior one that included 76 dwelling units. Uh, this proposal includes 167 parking spaces, off-street parking spaces. 102 are required for this development. Uh, the prior one had 128. Um, as was indicated, the height of the building under this proposal is roughly is 40 feet. Um, the prior approval and uh, conditional rezoning was 38 feet, uh, so it is slightly higher. Uh, the setbacks on the uh, prior development, uh, the, the closest was uh, six feet as far as a setback, and that was along Harrison. The only setback that doesn't meet 10 feet under this development is one under Building 1, which is the rear lot line along the uh, east property line of the little alcove that sticks up that the highlighter's going over this one. All the rest of them meet the minimum standard of 10 feet. Um, in terms of the landscaping and uh, uh, trees, they are removing a significant number of trees from the site, 83, but they are putting back, um, excuse me, yeah, they're, they're removing 83 and they're putting back 172 under the landscape plan, so they do comply with that as well uh, under the revision. Um, some of the deviations, again, I the uh, maximum height to width ratio, only building six and seven uh, don't comply with that, and those are the two on the end. They're longer uh, than one to three in the ratio. The other five buildings are compliant with the ordinance requirements. In terms of density, again, um, they are exceeding uh, what would be allowed uh, under the strict standard, but they are under your option for a density bonus. So under the ordinance, they'd, by right, they'd be allowed to put 34. You have the discretion under multifamily to grant a 100% bonus, so they could put basically 68. They're proposing 51. The variance that is needed here, there's two provisions that come apply. It's, it's closer than 150 feet to one family residential, so in order to grant that bonus, um, uh, that 150 foot requirement needs to one of those needs to be waived and so it, since there's two provisions in the uh, same wording it's you're either waiving the 150 foot from residential or you're waiving uh, the difference between 51 units and 34 units <coughs> if that makes sense to you what the ordinance says is you can grant a density bonus of 100% if the project's more than 150 feet away from residential hmm. zoning. It's not, so you can't grant the bonus. One of the two items needs to be waived. That's, that, side note, that's one of the reasons that when we're talking about multifamily, we, we want to get rid of one of those determinations because having two requirements in the same provision just creates confusion so anyways um, maximum height I did indicate is 30 feet uh, they are proposing 40 uh, we talked slightly about the setbacks one other one is the number uh, parking spaces are fine except for their dimensional uh, length uh, they are proposing to have two spaces inside uh, in garages uh, they're, they're required to be by 9 by 20 they're based on the interior dimensions going to end up being 9 by uh, 19 5 19 10 depending on which building you're in so they're under the 20 foot uh, length requirement for each space um, and there was an issue with the monument sign but since they've eliminated that uh, 
are, are going to eliminate that. That issue isn't there. Those are basically the uh, uh, deviations from the site plan. A couple of other items I would point out is they are proposing to put parking along Harrison Avenue in two different configurations. Um, one would be parallel right in front of uh, buildings. I have to zoom in. Going slow tonight. Three and seven. And yes. Right in front of buildings three and seven would be parallel. Uh, there'd be six spots, and then. Uh, to the east of that, where it dead ends into the land, into the um, bollard, there they would like to propose uh, 90 degree spots. Uh, they're also proposing landscaping on that uh, that dead end island diverter. All of those improvements would have to be approved under a license agreement with the uh, city commission. So that would be another condition of the approval, uh, and, and is listed in the. Uh, the write-up. Um, <clears throat> I think that's everything I needed to highlight. <clears throat> Mr. Twin, would this have to be in the form of two motions? No, it's one motion. It's a condition. You are recommending either approval of the conditional rezoning with with the conditions listed. Or however how you modify that. So it's one okay. motion as a recommendation to okay. the commission. Thank you. Mr. Casana? I'm just curious here. So this is a conditional rezoning. They come to us and say this is what we want. If we send them off and say, okay, one of your conditions is you gotta get a license agreement from the city commission for these uh, parking uh, out on the street. I I guess we'd have to ask, but I, that doesn't seem necessary to me. So what if the city commission doesn't grant that? Does the whole thing go down? Well, the purpose of the license agreement is above and beyond the zoning issue. The zoning issue is approving a site plan and rezoning of private property. You're not dealing with public right-of-way under the private property uh, portion of this. The Planning Commission really doesn't have a whole lot of uh, discretion on the right-of-way. Um, well, and secondly, from a liability standpoint, if they're going to improve it, and they're going to use it. The city's going to make them liable to maintain it, and anything that happens under it under the license agreement. And you generally don't do that in a zoning document. Well, but that, I guess is what I'm asking because we have that's one of the contingencies. The petitioner shall apply. My question is, if they apply and the city commission says no, is is that they'd have to modify the document? They'd have to modify the plan and come back. No, just it would get put in with curbs and a standard sidewalk. Okay. So we're just giving them permission to take a shot at it. It's not going to, it's not we're make, really make putting, a break we're, for this. We're really putting them on notice. They have to do that on top of what they're doing already. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Twing or the petitioner? Mr. Gasana? I have some questions for the petitioner. I think the architect is who I want to talk to. So that, that site does have a lot of trees, and I'm just, uh, I, just from the site plan, I don't want to make any assumptions here. Are, the, are there existing mature trees along the north property line that are going to remain, and if so, uh, what type of quantity are we talking? Yeah, as Alex mentioned, I think that there's roughly 11 trees that are going to remain. And I, you're going to supplement that with more plantings there? Yes, the landscape plan you can see that's shown here has a mixture of evergreen and deciduous that go all the way along, creating a real strong screen, along with that six-foot wood fence as well. Um, I, I, I love the fact that you provided renderings. You got a rendering facing the court. You got a rendering facing Harrison. This I, is it, what is the rendering? What, what does it look like facing north? This is this. That's what I was trying to talk about. When you look at this section. Yeah, 
the old technology. That's why they yeah, changed yeah. it. <laughs> the building's falling down. We need better foundations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, so that Harrison view is also the north-facing view. That's correct. correct. Yes. The neighbors that to our north, they were in their front, their rear yard. They were looking back at our building. This is what they would see. Okay. Except there's also mature trees there. Correct. Right, yeah, the, the larger trees would certainly screen this way. Okay, is there an east-facing elevation? That is the east-facing right. elevation. That is also the east-facing. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's why I said we looked at human scale and terracing on north, east, and all along Knowles and Harrison. Okay. All right, very good. The only other comment I'll make is I think your, uh, your solution on the signage is an improvement over the monument sign. Great, thank and you. I'll stop there. Any other questions for the petitioner or Mr. Twing? Ms. Beakey? Um, again, with the trees, I walked the site today, and, and I appreciate the fact that you're going to save the, some of the trees along the back line. I saw one very significant tree that looks like it's been there longer than most of us have been alive, or probably all of us. And I'm wondering if that one's going to be able to be saved, but I'm thinking maybe not because it, it might be sort of in the middle. But um, there was a 62-inch diameter. I think it's a eastern cottonwood or something like that I saw today. Do you, do you know? Or, or the only ones being saved along the property line with the houses? It's right in the middle of a building. No, it's in the middle of a building. It wouldn't be saved. A proposed building, correct. Yeah. Any other questions for the petitioner or Mr. Twain? No. Oh, Mr. Kluster. Yeah, uh, so based on your parking count or your parking tally, you seem to be significantly overparked uh, based on the ordinance requirements. Um, can you talk to the reasoning or the, the logic behind that decision? Well, the, the parking for the units is a tandem two car garage, and then it has an apron. So there's parking spaces in the apron. That's what's shown as in terms of total numbers, which gets the numbers up. Then we have some individual parallel spaces that are, my laser doesn't work, in the center green belt area, and then the spaces that, parallel spaces that are out along Harrison that we're talking about. So you can, you can talk about being significantly overparked, but basically for this scale and luxury of a unit, it's going to want to have a two-car garage. It'll want to have an apron just to keep separation between the building and the drive, and then we've put some additional guest parking out in that island for overflow for parties. Okay. So I, I wouldn't say that it's overparked. It just the numbers appear to be that way. Please, yes. Um, the landscaping that we have on here, I don't know if all of you, most of you were there when we did the Harrison before, we did not do any small trees on anything. We made our trees look like they'd been there for four or five years. I forget what they're called, but that line the street. And all of our boxwoods were tall. Everything we had was over. Because to me, if it doesn't look like it's finished, I don't want to wait three or five years later to see it get that way. So we've spent a lot of time and money in to make it look really nice when it gets done. And fences are not just regular fences they're they're done all of our fences are, are basically horizontal you kind of they're they've got a look to them that have a little bit of gap between them but they're also most they're all seated so very pretty thank you any other questions okay this is a public hearing so we will open it up to the public is there anybody here that would like to speak on this um proposal Yes, sir. <clears throat> Alex Schneider, 1011 Knowles. <clears throat> I'm right next to the proposed uh, development. And uh, <clears throat> it's, um, at least in my view, it's significantly better project than the last one. Uh, from the point of aesthetics, uh, beautification of the area, but also the point of now we're going to have ownership of the condominiums versus apartments. It's always a plus. Um, so 
Uh, I uh, I'm familiar with Robert Wolfson and his projects. And usually, when things uh, come up and he proposes them, he follows through and builds them. Unlike some other developers that uh, uh, coming up with unreasonable expectations or getting approved and then disappear. So he could be trusted. Um, have a look at Harrison. The Harrison project is wonderful. I know what it was. It was a horrible place, abandoned. Now, as far as the site itself, I can tell you that uh, one of the previous owners <clears throat> wanted to put dumpsters and trucks there. So anytime we go from that type of uh, desire to this type of proposal, it's a win-win situation for everybody. So um, I would be supportive uh, in, uh, in their request uh, for conditional rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, it's Ron Arnold from 1102 Irving also representing the Lawson Park Homeowners Association. I, uh, I'm going to move quickly here. I think I've already provided some uh, letters to the mayor and to your commissioner, Douglas. I'd like to object granting this variance for these variances for the Epic at Harrison. Uh, this development plan follows the now expired initial presentation and goes a little bit in the wrong direction. Alex was right. They must have gotten to Alex because he's right next door to it. But I think there's an opportunity to make this even better. I was very impressed with the uh, presentation, loving that. Um, I'm one street over from B Batavia, though, and that's going to rob daylight from the Batavia residents that overlap this. I wasn't sure if the terraces face east. Is that correct? So that's going to be a... Uh, a detriment for the backyards of our friends on Batavia because they will be under observance if those terraces are used. Uh, if they're not terraced, it's going to be a wall that their optimistic um, measurement to the structure uh, makes it look really good. Sadly, some people use their backyards, and so they'll be right up against that, what looks like a zero lot line uh, application for this development. Uh, that's partly because of this increased height variance. So you're going to have these uh, units looming over two-story houses, 100-year-old stock houses, single family on Batavia. I can see right across to that beautiful cottonwood. I looked at it today. I walked the site today. Uh, and those, you're right, those trees have got to be more than 100 years old. They were here long before us, and, and if this didn't go through, they'd be long after us. Uh, Progress is great. There's a lot of good things about this. The biggest objection I have is the crazy traffic flow that we have on those sort of back streets. Uh, Harris, Harrison and, and Knowles is the shortcut from coming uh, north on Main Street. So they turn right past a holiday market, do a high-speed transit over the train tracks, and then turn heading north on Knowles to get around the, the traffic. You know, I would, I would probably do that too, not quite as quick as they do, but uh, I, I'm one street over from Batavia. So uh, it's a bottleneck because of the uh, Royal Oak recycling business. So during the day, there's uh, large semi-trucks that come in and out of there. That is sort of a fact of life. We're used to that. They're probably not going away, at least not yet. This is going to impact the quality of life for our new residents' friends. Uh, I still don't quite understand the parking uh, arrangement because I think it, it has space for, they're looking for bigger families, three potential parking uh, spaces. So I think that's my, bat, my math is correct, 153. Sir, sir it's been three minutes. Uh, please, can I have just a few more minutes, a few more seconds? Okay. Uh, that's going to be 459 trips a day to add to that already uh, very, very busy. It's a cut through from 696 <clears throat> as well, the old truck route, um, uh, and the aesthetics of the landscaping, the setbacks are not sufficient, I think. 
I'd like to see how that on-street parking comes because we already have a problem with uh, trucks, uh, cars cutting through, turning on Harrison. So thank you for thank your you. time. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. Chris Reese, 524 Hudson. Um, we were one of the properties where the backyard was measured there. Um, we purchased our house about a year ago. Um, the whole reason we purchased the house, older, smaller family home, uh, quiet neighborhood, park right in front. Um, what I see here is very, very large. I mean, our house, 1,100 square foot, that's the average house in that area, and this is going to be built right inside of um, the area of the, that neighborhood. So Batavia, Hudson, and then Knowles. So it's essentially putting a building, I would say the size of a Walmart, in a small 100-year-old family neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, not ideal. Uh, it's not something that we move there for. It's not something we wanted to see. These terraces, um, the only thing they'll see is our house. The only thing we'll see is that terrace. That's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, hold on a minute. In the back, you had your hand up first. Hello. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I live on uh, 920 Knowles. I want to echo what the gentleman said about traffic on Knowles. According to the master plan, it's supposed to be a low traffic street. I would not consider it a low traffic street. There are cars moving up in there day and night, all speeds. Um, adding 500 extra trips a day would be very, very bad for traffic. It was supposed to be a low traffic speed, according to the master plan. Additionally, all of those um, there's no parking currently on Knowles in front of this um, structure. So all those cars, if they have gas, they'll be pushed up into Knowles North, across from my house, which is already very packed with cars. So. I would encourage you to consider that one voting on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Your name, please? Uh, Danielle Senator, 604 East Hudson. So I'm uh, bumping uh, the fence with the on the back of the property. Um, one concern that I would ask the city to really think carefully about the, the traffic and the amount of people and cars that are going to be on that street and the future consequences of that or revaluation of traffic. It's all, it's my point num number one. And the second one is they mentioned that they're going to keep some of the, the, the trees on the lot. And that's very positive. That's great. Uh, and I saw the rendering of the, the terrace of the unit with the tree. And I would like to know, is that for Ma'am, ma'am, direct uh, your comments to okay. the commission, please. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't That's know okay. I couldn't talk to them. That's I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I just want to know or point it out there that would be very interesting because if they have protect the privacy of their residents, for us would be, it goes both ways. So to be attentive to that detail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Name? Dave Pallack, live at 604 East Hudson. Question, uh, how tall are the trees going to be that are going to be backed up against my property when they're planted? I maybe, If I missed that, did anybody come up? I don't know if that was mentioned or not. Do we have a landscape plan, Tim? Yeah, it's in there. I don't know. The look. Yeah, I mean, like three feet, four feet? We'll, we'll, we'll get that for you. Okay. Is there any other... Con and also, I'll... And maybe I walked in late or not. So the terraces that are there right there, that's going to be what I'm going to be looking at? or Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank we'll you. get that number for you. Anyone else? Yes. Your name, please. Good evening. My name is Peter Rail. I live at 2308 Middlesex. Um, I am a local real estate agent and just kind of wanted to give – you know, my, my thoughts on this, you know, I've watched Royal Oak grow since I was young. I used to ride my bike around with my friends, go to Comet Burger, um, and I've been a resident since 2009. 
And I'm sure you guys have seen how much Royal Oak has really evolved, um, especially in the last you know, 10, 15 years. Um, you know, where, where I live, there's a lot of traffic that goes down uh, Helene Avenue that's right by my house as well. And it's an unfortunate truth, but luckily I have a, um, a gentleman who you know, has signs in the street to hope that people slow down. Um, but one of the things that you know, I've noticed, and it, it has its benefits and its costs, is a lot of the new construction homes in Royal Oak are, are pretty substantial in size. Um, you know, oftentimes their viewpoints from your, their window are, are overlooking a neighbor's home. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate that some of the, the 1,100 square foot homes are, are being knocked down and some of these larger homes are being built. But for a lot of people my age, affordability is getting kind of difficult, especially closer to downtown. Um, you know, it's the, the rental prices are increasing pretty substantially. And to be closer to kind of that downtown atmosphere, it's getting um, pretty pricey, especially if you want to buy a home for the first time or you have a young family and you want to be able to experience some of the cool events that we have downtown. Um, so I think that this proposal, I mean, not only is it beautiful um, and close to downtown, but as they proposed, it seems pretty affordable as well, um, especially for younger people and families. So I think that that's something that can kind of counter react some of the newer things that are being built as far as single family residences and you know, quite uh, a lot of apartment buildings are being built, but not a lot of investment opportunities for young professionals and younger families, you know, to kind of try to build some principal and, and have some ownership as opposed to just spending money on rental rates. So, um, you know, I think that the, the Harrison project is something that went from, you know, the old lumber yard to something that people look at now and they're, you know, amazed at how cool and refreshing it looks. Um, and it doesn't really, it's, it's not necessarily on the, the main strip or on, on Main Street or 4th Street and that kind of epicenter. It's set back just enough so where people can walk to Holiday Market, they can walk to downtown, ride to bikes, to parks and things like that. Um, you know, and I think that, that the, the affordability and the opportunity for people to be able to purchase something like that with those amenities is awesome for our city. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> you already spoke. I'm sorry, sir. Any, anybody else who hasn't? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Let's bring it back to the commission. I want to let the see if the applicant has any answers. Yeah, please. Could you do you have a comment on the trees? How high the trees are that are going to be planted? Okay, you'll have to come to the microphone. The evergreens that we're putting in are 10 foot tall okay. instead of five. Okay. And the um, regular sit, what, the, deciduous? What, the deciduous trees are four inch caliber, so they're 15 to 20 feet. Okay. There's nothing that is on this plan that is going to be little. Okay. And there's also that six foot fence also. It, but as long as you got that, this, these units are not large units. These units are 1,600 square feet. Thank you. So they're not like monster units. And by the way, the only reason that we have more cars is because we have to, to get in the garage, have an apron. Otherwise, it's just a two car, which is two cars times 51 units is only 100 people maximum that can be in there. So. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Casada and then Mr. Godek. Well, we have to make a motion and have a discussion. Then I'm going to make a motion. Make a motion. I make a motion to uh, approve the proposed conditional zoning with the contingencies, with the exception of the monument sign, which I think we don't need. Other than that, I think that's my motion. Is there support? Support. Support by Mr. Godek. Is there discussion? Mr. Godek and then Mr. Casada. Um, the, the I like the development. I, I think it, uh, it has some nice details. I think it's an improvement from what was passed last time. I don't think it's over parked because the, typically the tandem garages are going to get one car and, and filled up with other stuff. So I'm okay with um, with how that's laid out in, in uh, my. My single objection was the monument sign that's gone away, so I'll be supporting this motion. Mr. Casada? Yeah, um, 
uh, we heard some of the concerns, and those are legitimate concerns, but there's no such thing as a significant project. It doesn't have some uh, effects on penumbras, uh, you know, some, some good, some bad. So that always exists. But there's so many, uh, so much good about this project. I think overall it overwhelms, I think, and, and I think the neighborhood will will be happy when this when this is uh, when this is constructed. Also, just uh, the basis of the recommendation, there are A through I, just for the record. Uh, looking over these, this project meets all of those requirements. So I think this is uh, definitely support the plan. Any other discussion, Mr. Kluster? Uh, yeah, I I have some issues with the the 90 degree parking off of Harrison. Um, I don't I don't think it's particularly good planning to use a right away space and turn it into a parking lot. Um, so from a planning perspective, I don't I don't think I can support that item. Um, I think this is a fantastic use for this site. Um, the townhome scale is is really appropriate for that transition from that heavy commercial industrial to single family uh, residential. I think the execution of it in this case, um, it's a difficult site because they're deep single family lots and I think the way it's executed has a very suburban kind of execution to it with a lot of drives and parking. Um, I can't support the this plan. I, the idea of it, I think, is perfect. I think there are execution things that can be tweaked that pull the buildings back away from the property line, allow some of that backyard privacy. Um, uh, if we're looking at a 40-foot building height and coming up 10 foot above the, the ordinance allowed, um, I'd like to see that pulled back further from the property lines and and really provide a greater opportunity for privacy in those backyards. Um, again, concept I support greatly. I think the just the execution can can benefit um, from some minor tweaks to layout and planning. Ms. Beaky? I guess I would like to echo that. I, I, I like the, the, the number of units, the consideration for the parking and the storage with the garages as they are. But again, in respect to the privacy, I appreciate what he's saying uh, as far as tweaking. And again, of course, I have a bias towards with some of those older trees, if they're ever away from them to be saved, which perhaps in this condition, there's absolutely not. Um, but I appreciate the efforts along that fence line to keep some of the um, vegetation as it is. Ms. Douglas. So if we were to, if people were to build single family homes on this site of 30 feet in height, um, they could look out their second story windows into the windows of adjacent homes. So in a, I think in a tight urban area, there is always that, that privacy question. And I, I mean, I don't see anything that is um, all that much worse than you might encounter if you were building sa single family homes here. Um, I'm, I think the offering of for sale units is, um, is a good, is good play and is, it meets a need. We're getting a lot of apartment development in and around our downtown and not much, um, for purchase. And, um, I like the, the idea of the price point, the size and what I expect will be the price point that comes with it. We so often in these things we consider are, are dickering over setbacks and to have a development come in with all of the, um, you know, virtually all of the setbacks met um, is unusual and I think we're getting plantings that I mean Miss Beaky has been very strong about and rightly so um, we're we approved a plan with 70 some units we're now approving a plan with 50 units so we've reduced the density on the site um, and, and all in all I think it's a, I think it's an improvement on what we had approved before and I think an asset to our city thank you Ms. Douglas anyone else Mr. Twain, you well, just for clarity, you're, you're eliminating the proposed monument style sign. The only other contingency, contingency is that all other signs are going to comply. So I just want to make sure everybody understands there's no sign approved as part of this other than what's allowed as part of the uh, sign ordinance. Because I don't have a wall sign to tell you it complies or doesn't comply. Thank you. The petitioner indicated he was removing the monument sign and replacing it with a wall sign. 
I don't have that detail. I can't tell you what it is. You don't have that detail, so you're not approving that wall sign. That's, but that, that's the clarity. That will go through the usual uh, building department approval process. If it process. complies, it complies. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay. Mr. Casella. But the contingency says all signage shall all other signage shall comply right. and we I, don't have monument signs. I so just wanted on the record that yeah. the wall sign hasn't Understood. been blessed as part of this. Any other discussion? Let's call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. So one, two, two three, days. four to two. Approved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Uh, this is uh, another public hearing. Uh, this is uh, for a revised special land use permit and site plan to connect restaurant with alcoholic beverage service into adjacent office and storage space. This is the in-season cafe at 500 East 4th Street, Mr. Twing. Well, this was in front of you uh, early, I believe it was in January of this year, where you approved uh, the expansion of the in-season cafe. Uh, the petitioner now is in front of you asking that a couple of the contingencies that were part of that approval uh, be eliminated. Uh, basically, the requirement for uh, the exterior refuge enclosure to be eliminated, as well as the requirement that the uh, uh, adjacent alley and areas to the south uh, be paved, uh, uh, as well as the requirement to reconstruct the driveway out to Knowles. Now those are three revisions the, uh, the uh, petitioner is asking the Planning Commission to remove uh, from its special land use site plan approval from earlier in the year. Uh, if you do remove those uh, as part of your special land use uh, rev revision, you would have to grant permission uh, for the petitioner to go to the zoning board to actually get those waived. Uh, those are specific ordinance requirements that uh, uh, are not uh, uh, subject to a waiver by uh, this body. Uh, but because it was part of your special land use, uh, the first step is for you to consider whether you would still grant the special land use approval without those contingencies. Um, so if you feel those are important contingencies to remain, then you would not grant a revision. Uh, you'll see that the engineering department and the planning office do not support those revisions uh, for the reasons listed. Uh, you can see from the uh, photo that uh, uh, the alley is, is used, uh, the curb is driven over, uh, and for all of those reasons uh, that are again listed, you, you'll, you'll see that uh, engineering and planning staff uh, recommend against that. However, if you uh, did want to grant the petitioner's request, we've also included uh, uh, contingency items there, uh, and they would need to uh, go to the zoning board, as I said, to waive the required screening around the enclosure or, and or re recycling receptacles, as well as hard surfacing paving of driveways and other areas. I guess that's my summary of their request for Thank revisions. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Twain? Petitioner here. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Levitt, L-E-A-V-I-T-T. I represent the In Season Cafe located at 500 East 4th Street in Royal Oak. With me this evening is the owner of the restaurant, uh, Nicholas Raftus. And... Ladies and gentlemen, we are asking for an amended site plan, and we would ask the opportunity to go in front of the zoning board in order to ask for waivers as to two aspects of the site plan which has been amended and presented to this board. The first amendment is the request is to eliminate the paving and replacement of the alley behind the uh, restaurant and the adjacent building. The reason for this is my client has been operating this restaurant for 38 years and was asked to combine two buildings that he owned into one. The reason was the building adjacent to the restaurant was used for storage. 
um, it wasn't zoned properly requiring the special land use. My client was not aware of that when he bought the building or buildings some over 30 years ago and has operated that restaurant for the entire time period. Was recently notified that there was a problem. That's why he submitted the request for special land use. The reason why he doesn't feel that the alley is to be replaced is necessary is as follows. He is not changing the use of his property. When contingencies come about for special land uses or requirements or conditions, the petitioner is usually asking for a change of the facility or the building or property. This is not the case. All Mr. Raftis is going to do is create an opening in the wall to connect both facilities, which he doesn't have now. He's not changing one bit seating capacity. He's going to have the same amount of tables and chairs, the same amount of uh, patrons. He's not increasing the size of his restaurant whatsoever. He's just opening up a doorway for the storage facility, which is adjacent to his restaurant. So as a result, we don't see that there's a nexus between having to repave and reconstruct the ingress to an alley when um, it's owned by the city, the alley. It's not owned by Mr. Raftis. He's been using that restaurant and operating it for 38 years. It was unbeknownst to him that there was a problem with the zoning until, again, he was approached by the city recently. As to the trash receptacle, the dumpster, Mr. Raftis has a plan where he will remove the dumpster and in exchange use trash receptacles that can be picked up twice a week. He measured the amount of refuse that his restaurant uses and it's under the two cubic yards per week and under the ordinance section 633.2A51 he can use smaller trash receptacles without having to construct a wall around a dumpster. And as a result, because his restaurant uses less refuse than a regular restaurant, the reason is it's a vegan-style restaurant, vegetarian. They recycle a lot of the actual product that they use in the kitchen. And so there's not a lot of waste, as you would find in a normal restaurant. So we don't feel that at this point it would be necessary to reconstruct and, and, and erect a wall around a dumpster when Mr. Raftis is proposing to remove the dumpster and use trash receptacles, which are allowed in the city. So for those reasons, we would ask that the waiver of the reconstruction of the alley, as well as the waiver of the wall to be built around a dumpster, which is no longer necessary for Mr. Raftis's business, be waived and allow Mr. Raftis to present his case to the zoning board uh, to request waivers of those uh, uh, contingencies that were originally required back in January when he presented the original site plan. Thank you for the time, and do you have any questions? Can I? I don't want to speak. Please. Uh, he made a couple of minor errors. I've owned the in season since 2002. When I purchased the in season, I bought both buildings and the business combined together. Uh, the legal description on the deed of both buildings was that they were joined together already. When I went to the assessor's office, ultimately after I submitted all this stuff, and I actually did join the buildings together. I did not have to change the language on the deed. So that I was fraudulently induced into purchasing that property because they acted like it was joined together. The only time I found out it wasn't is when Tim showed up after I bought the liquor license. So we're trying to take the building that's been used for 21 years at 502 East 4th Street and has the same function for the last 21 years and all I want to do is get a permit for it. I don't see how the dumpster and paving the city's alley 
it is right in this case. And furthermore, I feel we have a rat problem in Louisville. I feel the rat problem is a result of dumpsters. The dumpsters are a playground for the rats. The residences, they have sealable containers. The totes are sealable. They seal. You can't get a rat in there. The dumpsters are open. It's a little box. The guy shakes it. The lids get all distorted. They don't seal. It's a playground. And you want me to build a house for the playground for the rats. So I'm kind of against it philosophically. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Okay, not seeing you. Well, I'm, we're going to open up public hearing then. If you could just have a seat. Thank you. Is, this public hearing? Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this proposal? Okay, not seeing you. I'm going to close the public hearing, bring it back to this side of the table. Any discussion, motion, questions, Mr. Kassan? I have a question for Mr. Twink, just so I'm clear on this. So um, they don't have to have a dumpster, is this correct? They don't have to have a dumpster. They could have uh, garbage containers, but would they still under the code have to build a, uh, an enclosure? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're citing a storm, uh, or not the storm, the solid waste ordinance. The zoning ordinance says if you have outside uh, refuge, you have to enclose it. If, if the commercial restaurant? Anyone. Apartment complex, if you have an outside uh, dumpster, you have to enclose it. Single family? So but it, not you, single but family, though. No, it, you don't go through site plan, and, and it's only related to things that are going through site plan approval. So. Sounds like he wants to put the same kind of a container I would have at my home. If that's That's correct. Okay, and if but, he does that, he has to close But we've got it. we've got we've got businesses downtown that have small refuse containers, and they're required to put them inside your building okay. with a roll-up door. Okay. So it, the zoning ordinance is separate from the uh, solid waste ordinance. The solid waste ordinance simply addresses what kind of container you're going to have based on the, based on the uh, size of your refuse items. So you'd have it to pull says it if you generate over a certain amount, you have to have a certain type okay. of. Okay. But this solid waste ordinance that's cited 600 whatever is not relevant to what's in the zoning ordinance. So even if he has separate containers other than a dumpster, he still has to pull them in. Well, even if, even if he wants to propose that and not put okay. up an enclosure around it, he still has to go to the ZBA. So if okay. you want him to have that ability, you still got to give him permission to go to the ZBA. Gotcha. Okay. I, I just got another follow up question. I mean, there are, there are unenclosed dumpsters all over the city. Those are, I, I go to the, on the alleys in Woodward, they're all over the place. So those are, those are because they have Those are grandfathered in because yeah. this development hasn't gone through it. His is grandfathered in until he needed site plan approval to expand his restaurant into the space next door. The reason this came before you was the site to the east, the building to the east, has never been approved for a restaurant use under city records. It's potentially been used that way, but it's never been approved as a restaurant use under city records. Okay. Uh, the petitioner bought a liquor license, and that's the special land use part of this. It's not a restaurant operation. And he wants permission to get the liquor uh, approved under the special land use so that he can start selling what's allowed under that license. So um, that's what kicked this in in, in, in uh, January was that request the inspections done by building and staff as part of the liquor license request <coughs> and determine that there's never been an approval for a restaurant in the building space to the east. The requirement for the wall is, or the opening in the wall for the doorway is so that he's not taking his prepped food and stuff out of, a, out of that area out into the alley into the restaurant next door. He's doing it all internal. So there's a... There's a reason for why this is a change of use and an expansion of and why it's in front of you. Now, if you want to still want to grant the special land use and grant permission, that's fine, but it, it still need still needs the special land use approval and site plan approval as as you dealt with in January. <coughs> and that's the first step in order to be allowed to get a building permit and to get the liquor license. <coughs> Thank you. 
Ms. Douglas. Uh, in a similar vein, what provisions in our ordinances um, allow us to require a private business to repave a public alley? The same ones that allow you to require uh, the tower to make improvements to its site. Um, it's adjacent to it. It's using you. You're re required to fix the uh, access around your property, the sidewalks, uh, potentially the curb. Uh, you've got projects you've approved streetscapes on in the CBD out in the right of way. All of those same provisions. Um, so. <coughs> Any other questions, Mr. Kluster? Just. To clarify, the contingency on the alley is just for the portion of the alley to service this property. It's not the entire alley. That would be all our requirement would be for it is that what's adjacent to his property um, uh, area and then out into the right of way so you could actually get to it rather yeah. than jumping over the curb. Okay. And for the for the waste enclosure, whether it's uh, eight yard dumpster or whether it's small containers they would need to come back and show us whether it's outside in an enclosure or inside it just it needs to show up on a plan for I mean you could keep it inside the building if you wanted to designate an area for inside the building it would, we would need to see a plan that indicated such yeah. Ms. Douglas well, we would need to see a plan or just the building department would just need I mean we would if he wanted if he doesn't want to do the enclosure the other option is to put it inside the building and tell us where that is you don't have to have an outside. But the planning commission doesn't need to see No, you that. wouldn't need to see it. Right. You said those. we. I... Yeah. So would this be two motions? Well, th there's no need for any motion. If you don't want to rescind your prior approval, you don't need to take any action. Mm. Okay. We've suggested that you declare the request. You would make a recommendation of denial. Okay. If you want to amend it, then yes, you would need to make a motion to uh, modify the site plan contingencies under this special land use and allow them to go get the uh, variance from the ZBA. So that would be a motion to allow them to go forward to the ZBA. Yep. That would be one motion that we could make. Okay. Or we could make a or motion to deny. It. I mean, you can do it two if you want or do it one. I okay. Either one side. Uh, Ms. Beakey, I'm sorry. If, if they had not come forward from their business to get the liquor license or the, in the permission about the door, which I guess are combined, would this small driveway that's here in this alley just have been ignored because it's grandfathered in because it's just been like that? Um, I mean, well, or, until, or until, like I said, until there is a reason to determine something happened. I mean, we catch people all the time that have done something, and I, I'm not saying he did it. At some point in time, somebody uh, uses space, and when and when there's a determination that they've never been approved to use that space for what they're using it for, the city takes action to make them make corrections. So I, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Um, if in season continue to operate in its fashion without any need for uh, an expansion or a change, then none of this would be in front of you. Uh, Mr. Kasana. So, if we want them to go forward, we can't we can't waive these because they're they're code requirements. All we can do is let them go to the ZBA and make their pitch. Because it's a special land use, you have to grant permission for them to seek any waivers. Since you didn't grant that previously, they're now back in front of you asking for permission to go in front of the ZBA and waive these two or three contingencies. Um, so, Ms. Douglas, in action, uh, if we do nothing? If you do nothing, the January stands. So we don't, we don't have to vote to do nothing no. just to put... Right, and my only, my only suggestion would be that if you want to, deny, if you want to clear the deck and make sure there's a a clean record, I would suggest you make a motion to deny this request for revision. So that, that was my question. I'm going to make a motion to deny this request. Support. 
Okay, so there's a motion on the table to deny this request, and there's a support by Mr. Kluster. Is there a discussion on this? Mr. Godek. Um, <coughs> could you guys clarify what I'm voting on here? I'm a little confused. Um, uh, the, the, the request is to for the petitioner to go in front of zoning to get variances on three items. And we're, what is the motion to do? I'm sorry. We're to de deny those. We're denying them the opportunity to go before the zoning board. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, I, are we discussing it at this time? Yes. Uh, as a family business here and with what's been going on there, um, I won't support the motion. I think uh, uh, having them pave the alley and, and do this other stuff, uh, I, I don't think is necessary here. Mr. Casana? So I, I thought I heard it said that this, you know, I've been out to the site and I've looked at it, but I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't quite recall. If they were to pave the alley from their lot line to the west, to Knowles, is that still going to leave part of the alley as a dirt alley? To the east? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so they're just going to do their part. They're going to do their part in the, if, if you, if you, leave it with the approved site plan they have to correct the driveway in the curb that's out in Knowles right away and then they have to pave the the alley in their property adjacent to it that's not paved to the east property line <clears throat> miss no okay so i i can't i can't support the motion either i i, I would like to allow them the opportunity to go to the zoning board and let the zoning board make a decision on this. Um, I, I, I think the dumpster should be enclosed or some trash receptacles should be enclosed, but to make them pay the alley, I, I just can't support that. I agree with Mr. Godek. This is a long-standing business. They've made uh, a mistake, uh, you know, not, a, not an unintended mistake, and they want to move forward to try to prosper their business further, so I won't support it. I guess my preference would be to allow them to go to the zoning board also because it seems like something that has been functioning and isn't a detriment to the community. Oh, that's right, Lee. Any other discussion? Ms. Douglas. Well, I just feel like we're kind of kicking, we, we kick the can down the road a lot to the zoning board, um, and to me this seems pretty clear-cut, and I'm just not, not inclined to to not take responsibility for mm -hmm. a decision. I appreciate that. Okay, so if there's no more discussion, we should call for the vote. Um, the motion is to deny this plan uh, with support by Mr. Kluster. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Four so. no's. Four no's, so the motion fails. Okay, Ms. Beakey. I just want to make sure I understand, because in January we went over a longer list, and it moved forward, and, and now it's come back to these items on the list, and right now we're only talking about these items as far as the zoning board. Everything else would stay as it was. Is that correct? No. Okay. Mr. Godek. I'd like to make a motion to uh, allow them to go to the zoning commission with these three items. So would that be then an approval of this to move forward to the zoning plan or the zoning um, board mr twing is that how right. motion to approve them yep. to move forward okay is to there a support approve their request okay is there support on that support support by mr casada is there discussion on this motion i mean do we want to include or is it included just to make sure i'm understanding that the whatever the garbage receptacle is in the end it would be either enclosed or inside the building or just leave it as it is because it's going to the zoning i guess i'm well no, we're you're, you're granting them permission to go ask to waive the enclosure oh i see i see so it wouldn't be enclosed if the zoning board i see and it. we cannot include that because that's mixing things up okay Mr. Twin, could you repeat that one more time? I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Well, they're requesting 
to modify the special land use associated site plan to not have to enclose the refuge, to okay. not have to pave the alley, okay. and not have to pave or, or re reconfigure the drive approach out into Knowles. Okay. Those are the three items that are part of your special land use site plan approval from January. Okay. They're asking not to do those. Okay. The motion is to approve a modified site plan or a modified special land use uh, without those contingencies, but since those are zoning ordinance requirements as well, they need to go to the ZBA to get okay. them actually waived. Okay. So you're granting that permission. To okay. Th thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on this? All those in favor to approve this, say aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? No. No. So four to two moves forward to the zoning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, item number four in the new business. Another public hearing. This is a zoning ordin ordinance text amendments to allow permeable pavement for parking lots and driveways. Um, very, very briefly, uh, the Planning Commission has seen these uh, amendments at uh, uh, prior meetings. Um, you directed staff to schedule a public hearing tonight for these uh, draft uh, zoning ordinance amendments. Basically, what they do is uh, broaden uh, uh, types of uh, paving materials that can be used uh, for driveways, parking lots, to include uh, uh, permeable type pavers uh, and, and similar materials. Uh, it does not allow for uh, uh, loose aggregate or uh, or gravel. Um, so that's it broadened the uh, definition while staff was allowing some of those things uh, 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 Planning Commission felt it was important to, to uh, include them so it was clear. Uh, it also under the residential driveways uh, allowed an opportunity for um, uh, ribbon type driveways to be considered um, and uh, which are basically two hard surface tracks with uh, a non hard surface material in between which could be uh, you know anything from reinforced turf grass sod and that's one of the items in, in the uh, uh, provision uh, those are the basic uh, uh, revisions uh, 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 that are in front of you tonight uh, for this public hearing thank you mr. twins are there any questions or comments on this and this is a recommendation to the city commission to amend the ordinance. So if you wanted it to go forward after the public hearing, you'd make a recommendation that the commission approve these ordinance changes. I have a question about um, it's... Um, and we're recommending the one item that's in red where it says grass or sod, we're recommending reinforced turf. But... There wasn't a clear direction from the Planning Commission last time. So, um, the, the uh, two paragraphs above it says, it says off street parking areas or an area used for storage of vehicles should be hard surface. Could the hard surface be pervious pavers? If, you pa if this ordinance revision gets passed, yes. It could, okay. Could the ribbon part of the driveway uh, the track could that be uh, a pervious material also is there any if we've if you amend it and it's considered hard surface yes okay all right I didn't want to prevent any you know if someone wanted to do a little bit more infiltration okay need a public hearing open it. oh thank you I got a quick Gassan. question what is reinforced turf? Um, it's a system where they've got it contained. It might have openings in it of certain sizes, but it's it's got a hard material on the exterior generally, and the turf grows in the middle. So there's something that's oh, like those cells. It. Yes. Yes. Like yeah. That. Okay. Good word. Yeah. 
There are big cells like this, and the turf will grow in, in the middle of it. They use them for embankments, too, because it holds the soil in place. Yep. You can drive on them, too. And is the recommendation of the department that we don't say grass or sod, but we say reinforced turf, or we put all three? Yes, primarily because uh, if it's a ribbon driveway, it might get driven on. Um, you know, by some vehicle, whether it, I don't know, motorcycle it might visit or other vehicles might vis visit. So rather than just driving on grass, we're, we're suggesting it be reinforced. I, I think it's going to get driven on. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> I think it's going to get driven on, absolutely. It, it certainly will. So, okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this? Okay, um, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the side. So do you need, the, what is Motion this? to recommend something to the city commission. To the city commission, okay. Or you can postpone it, do nothing. Okay. Is there a motion? Motion to recommend the tax amendments to the city commission. Mr. Closter, is there support? I support. Support by Ms. Beakey. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moves on to the city commission. Well, that was three minutes, so that was good. <laughs> we discussed it last year. Reinforced side. We're limping along. All right, <laughs> next is other business. Uh, these, uh, there are no more public hearings, so. Um, the rest are sign variances. But well, we do to give notice on sign variances. So. Okay. But to just adjacent properties. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're moving into other business. This is a sign variance to a request to install wall and projecting signs for grocery store Meyer Woodward Corner at 30955 Woodward Avenue. With a bunch of variances that Mr. <laughs> Twing's going <laughs> to tell us about. Uh, well, I'm going to try to get to the elevation. Um, the elevation that's displayed on the screen and as part of your uh, packet is the elevation that was included as part of the uh, PUD uh, agreement, development agreement that was ultimately reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission and the uh, City Commission back uh, as part of uh, Site Plan 170101. Uh, as part of that approval, it also uh, uh, included uh, a contingency that uh, indicated that the uh, signs could be allowed as depicted on the uh, various elevations. So if you look at Building C, which is the only building we're talking about as part of the uh, Woodward Corners where Myers is proposing to go in, the east elevation under the original or under the current approval, was going to allow three wall signs, as, as depicted at the top elevation, of various sizes, um, and totaling those up on the east facade, uh, you had some 157.5 square feet of wall sign area. Uh, the petitioner is proposing to add to that and is requesting an additional uh, 378.16 <clears throat> square feet um, of signage along the east facade. And I'll slide down to their elevation in a minute. Uh, the second one, the second uh, elevation is the west elevation. And again, there was one sign depicted uh, with approximately 75 square feet. Uh, the petitioner is proposing to have one or to have signage on that facade uh, totaling uh, 192 square feet. So they're asking for a waiver of 92 and a half square feet on the uh, on the uh, west facade. Um, item C is in regard to the south facade, and that is. The third elevation on it depicted in front of you, which shows uh, two signs uh, with a total of uh, 
117.5 square feet, again under the PUD. Petitioner's asking for one additional wall sign on that facade and an additional 418.16 square feet uh, of signage area. In addition to that, I guess I'll squirrel down now. In addition um, to those signs, uh, they're asking for a sign, a wall sign that extends beyond the vertical ends of the building, uh, which is not allowed, and that would wrap around the south elevation and the east elevation. So that's item D. It would, it would extend out more than uh, 12 inches allowed. It extend out some three and a half feet, so that's one of the variances in there as well. Uh, and, and that sign would add an additional 141.94 square feet to each of those facades, uh, the south and the east elevation. Finally, they're proposing to have uh, uh, projecting, projecting signs that are basically underneath the uh, canopy. Um, they're asking for three of those for on the east facade and two on the south side. Each one is almost 12 square feet, 11.96. Those are the basic variances that the petitioner is requesting uh, in order to uh, have the sign each that's depicted on the uh, uh, elevations in front of you. Thank you. Any questions from Mr. Twing? Uh, Mr. Casada. Just so I'm clear, uh, are there the blade signs? Are these on? Um, they don't have drawing numbers here. Um, yeah, they're very they're very small, but they're the arrows. If you if you read see the arrows on the elevation, you can see yes. where they're going. Right. I'm looking for uh, which are the blade. Maybe I should ask the petitioner that. So I will. Okay. Okay. It's the petitioner here. Good evening. Um, my name is Tom Reeder. I'm an architect uh, from Meyer, um, architect with Bergman Associates here representing Meyer. Uh, Rebecca from Allen Industries is here. It's her application. She's a sign vendor. And Mike Flickinger is here from Meyer as well. So you can pretty much answer all your questions. Um, the blade signs. There's minor, actually, there's three blade signs on the south elevations and two on the east elevation. There's a little transcription thing, but there's five in total. <coughs> The blade signs, they're, you know, they're 11 square feet, they're square. The, what, what you have on the, the elevation of the building, I've got a canopy at, um, that projects five feet out from the building, um, and it's the, the soft of the canopy is like 16 feet above the sidewalk. Those blade signs are up against the building underneath the canopy, and there's a light fixture, there's a wall scant. It's, so it's basically between the wall scant and the, uh, and the canopy. So they're... It's it's probably a foot and a half below the top of the canopy, but above the wall scone. Okay, and I was also looking for a picture of it. Is that on that's the page? It, right? There you go, right there. there. Okay, that's it. Okay, and this is lit uh, internally yes. or <clears throat> internally? Yes, it is. the um, the The reason for the uh, the 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 blade signs is there's uh, we have two uh, vendors inside the store. This is their only shot at wayfinding recognition that they're there. Um, the store is set up, it's, it's pretty much a walkable community. I mean, I've got 20-foot-plus sidewalks on both sides. The whole development is, is set up to be walkable. The only shot I have at wayfinding for those tenants are those blade signs, to be honest. But that's one of the reasons for them. Uh, another quick question. Where are the entrances uh, on these elevations? I was out there, but I, I'm not sure I, I knew where they were. The entrance is in the corner. So under the corner sign right. is one entrance. Actually, there's a there's a it's a it's a big canopy. There's a column in the corner. It's a 45 degree cutout, and that entrance is that 45 degree angle. Okay, and there's there's not there's not an entrance on the there, north, I have, I have north exits. sign. I have two other exits in the building, but they're not they're exits. Okay, thank you. Any 
Any other questions for the petitioner? The on the Sorry, Mr. Closter. Uh, on the east and the south elevation, are those um, large uh, spans of glass? Are those roll up over or folding overhead doors similar to the Bridge Street exactly. market? Okay. Exactly. On this elevation, yeah. Got one, two, three roll up doors, and then there's three more positions. Those are fixed glass. So it's a similar idea that though that'll open up and it'll kind of be I mean, kind of that Street in was out. The first thing. one. Yep. This is the second one. So this is it's it's, it's basically a new concept for Meyer and um, like I said, it's a, and that's one of the reasons for the the corner sign. It's 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 part of branding. Um, the the local and fresh signs um, on a, on a main store you always have um, fresh and um, and um, home. Which is, which is grocery and merchandise. This is kind of a play off of that. It's fresh because it's all grocery and local because um, the tenants, the, the vendors, are typically local food vendors. You know. The, uh, the Bridge Street Market has just the one main building sign at the corner entry location and then looks like several of the blade signs. Is that correct? Right. It's also a, a smaller store. And, they don't have what we have here. I've got we basically we have three sides. Um, the uh, I, you know there's a there's an entrance to the east. There's an entrance to the west off of a uh, 13 mile road, and then the main entrance off of Woodward comes in and we're facing the front of the store. So basically we're trying to get signage on the three sides and we're trying to be cog cognizant of what's important, what isn't. The uh, the 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 um, western entrance. You know, between us and Beaumont, not a lot of traffic that coming in that way. So we, it's a smaller sign, but we, and that's the side where the truck well is as well. So, you know, we downplayed the sign a little bit, but we still want to, people to know that this is our building because there's no direct, we have no signage on either 13 or Woodward. So we don't get a shot at them until they enter the site. Um, the other signs, I mean, Yes, when they when they submitted for the PUD, um, they didn't have our signage package, and it you know honestly it was a little light. Um, proportionally, I think we got it. I think we hit the the mark. Um, I'm right now. I'm about um, maybe just a touch under four percent of uh, the, the total facade coverage for the signage, which is pretty typical for actually it's it's almost exactly what the um, these the percentages for the um, the main store, Meyer store in Royal Oak, as a comparison. Um, these signs are, um, there's letters on top of a uh, kind of a grid system, so it's, it's not like a big plexiglass, you know, backlit sign. They're individual letters on a grid, so. How are they illuminated? All the letters are internally lit. Internally, okay. Mr. How are you going to how are you going to manage the lumens there? What kind of brightness are we talking about in this internally? Uh, the corner sign, I think, is what you're talking about, right? Well, actually, all the letters and all the signs they're they're all lit. Okay. Um, what kind of lighting? Are they LED Becca, lighting? You you know what I'm worried about. Do you have the output on that? We don't have the output, and unfortunately, um, even speaking to GE, they can't determine the lumens or the nits or anything of that sort until a sign would be built and with a special camera. They are going to be behind an acrylic face with the vinyl in front of it, with the white vinyl, and that will keep any of the, it won't be considerably bright, but it'll be um, enough to be eye-catching at night. And so, I mean, it's not going to be blinding to anybody going by, and it's not going to be... Obscured is going to be very uh, actually elegant to the community, I believe. And so yeah, I, I would just comment: you don't need a lot of light to make letters light up, and we no, see no. people always overusing the LEDs, so they're uh, obnoxious. So but we use minimal LEDs about. inside the lighting. Um, number one for cost, and because you don't need many LEDs inside the lights, we go back to GE, and they recommend how many lights should be according to the square footage of the sign. So it's all recommended by um, General Electric for the lights that we use. Do you, do you do um, lights that are that are dimmable? I mean, you, you can control them, or are they always one brightness? They're always one brightness that we control. They would have to put a dimmer or a timer on those externally, um, which 
they do on like EMCs and that nature they do for like nighttime and daytime um, typically for the signs that are on a building they don't need that generally because they they're not overbearing I guess you could say compared to an electronic message center they're a lot I guess mute compared to that all right the concern the current concern is if you don't know how bright they're gonna be and they show up too bright you're not gonna be able to do anything about it but uh, you're gonna you're gonna take the lead in making sure that how bright these are right we just put the minimal amount of LEDs inside the lights they'll have the vinyl that's over the front of them and then they use diffusers in the back of them to keep the brightness down too much because they are white and white is a brighter color however it's not going to be overbearing it's just going to stand out against the dark facade because it's a brick facade you need to have the lighter color but they wouldn't be too bright no all right thank you mm -hmm. any other questions is there a motion Public hearing. Douglas. No, it's not a public hearing. Ms. Douglas. Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, move to allow um, the five variances proposed. Is there support? Support. Is it, um, is it Mr. Godin? Okay. Is there any discussion? Mr. Kluster. Uh, yeah, I think the um, the the signage is is very tastefully done. I mean, you look at the Bird Street Market and I think it, it has a very minimal aesthetic and it serves for wayfinding when it's at the entry. Um, I, I, the size of this building, I can see having the Woodward Corner Market sign on the three visible facades. Um, the, the local and the fresh, I think, is, is unnecessary um, and adds visual clutter that, it, that I don't think is appropriate for this this type and, and not in comparison with what the Bridge Street Market does. Um, so I, I really, even the blade signs I think are, are minimal and tastefully done and um, serve to identify tenants which serve kind of that wayfinding purpose which is I think kind of the our general litmus test of when we look at sign variances do they serve a wayfinding purpose. Um, so I, I can support all the variances except for the local and the fresh signage on the south and east elevations. Mr. Godek. Uh, I'm okay with the variances as presented. Um, I, I think um, with the size of the building, they're in scale. I also think a lot of the, because of the way the site is developed, these buildings are set back. Um, considerably from 13 and Woodward so you're it's more wayfinding once you're in the site um, and they seem aesthetically okay to me any other discussion on the motion okay now seeing all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed no motion moves forward approval five to one Congratulations. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, next, this is a sign variance. Uh, request to replace menu boards for fast food drive through restaurant at McDonald's at 2829 was 14 mile. Mr. Twing. Uh, this is very similar to a request you received uh, last month uh, regarding menu boards. Uh, they're basically uh, replacing Two of them are there. Uh, I believe two. Yeah. And then adding the uh, menu boards back, as well as what have been termed as pre-browed menu boards, and they are covering 100% of those with uh, electronic message centers, uh, where the ordinance only allows 50%. Uh, uh, and given that, the aspect ratio doesn't comply with what's in the ordinance either. Thank you, Mr. Twing. Any questions? The petitioner here. Welcome. Hello. It's been a long night. I drove state from Chicago. Um, I'm Michelle Freeman. I'm with Kaiser Industries. I thought you were, <laughs> thought you were behind me. 
Um, I, just, I guess. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I think like what you mentioned is last month there was um, the same scope, the same project scope that was um, brought to your attention for review. So just things I like to highlight when I go through is um, with this, with the new menu boards, as you know, the um, actual displayed signage area is significantly reduced. Um, like most of them currently, there's two different styles of boards. They can either be 41 square foot of signage or 42 square foot. And now the new boards are 20, the menu boards themselves. And then the pre-brows are 10 because one screen versus two screens. Um, also, I know that you had, on the last one, you had talked about lighting. Um, so with these LED, they do have auto sensors built into them uh, so that they automatically adjust to ambient lighting to go anywhere from fifth, uh, 500 nits to 2,500 nits. Um, if you don't know nits, I can explain it because I've learned a lot through this project. Um, but like now with the way that the fluorescent lighting is, they're in lumens, so there are like 55, thousand I think lumens I have it right here 56 850 total estimated and then the new lighting if you were looking at that same comparison of lumen lighting they um, go as low as uh, but just a little over 8500 up to like 33 so even the lighting is significantly reduced even at its brightest it's just the way that they're measured um, between like lumens versus foot candles versus nits it's just a little bit different um, I like to also point out that with the um, new signage going, moving to like the digital copy, and even the reason why they have, want the pre browse is because they're eliminating the POP, which they call the point of. Uh, since the plastic merchandise. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, point of, point of purchase. Yeah, the point of purchase. So those are like the toppers that you see, the flag things, like, you know, it's time for. Um, uh, shamrock shake or all these things that's what that additional pre-browse does is allowed because um, 70 percent of their business is through drive through so being able to have that show the information to the customers in that second car it helps to um, keep the like the flow of traffic a lot faster and smoother which is safer um, it's also safer for the employees they don't have to go out and change the manual copy um, in the drive through um, trying to think what else with this one but I probably overstating a lot of things you heard last month about the boards. Uh, do you have any questions for me, or do you have anything to add? No, these are the exact same boards that were approved last month um, for our other location, and the same boards that were approved like six months ago. Um, we're just, they were supposed to be on the rebuild at 14 and Coolidge. We already removed the road sign. We went to Monument Signs. We got all the signage, but these signs were in test, so we could not put it in at the time we rebuilt that location. So now it's time to, to, to update it and get the old signs out and the smaller ones put back in, and that's why we're here. So, Any questions for the petitioner? Mr. Goda. These petitions are strictly for the menu boards? They're, they're menu boards, correct. So there's no, like, you're not looking for changes on the, the building itself or this uh, mm -hmm. sign? No, all that sign package is complete already and went through the variance. Okay. And we removed the road sign, went to Monument, but we just, the boards weren't ready when the time we rebuilt it, so. Thank you. Mr. Casada. Uh, this is the 14-mile McDonald's. Correct, the one that's surrounded by American Axle. Like, yes. I, okay. no, I, can, I can tell you that mm -hmm. you, you've got an electronic messaging board sign, Monument sign, and it is not uh, compliant in the cycling. So I would hope that... That's 30 seconds. It's not 30 seconds. It wasn't the other day when I went out there and, and took a video of it. So I know it's not. Some of our six seconds, eight seconds, some are 30 seconds. So I would ask that that, that be addressed. But okay, for sure. Thank you. That's a good point. I was going to say the same thing. Because I remember when we approved that, I was not in favor of but nevertheless it was approved. and. It's pretty bright too, so I don't know if that—that's an issue. But. Yeah, I don't know. I—I I, I don't know. Is it—is the sign, if you, if you don't mind, is the sign, the monument sign, is it manipulable in terms of the brightness? You know, that would be something for the sign company. It should have some kind of dimming. I'm not sure on that, other than maybe reaching out to them and get specs. I don't know the—I don't know the, the numbers. So I'm, I'm burgers and fries. These guys are. Gonna, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I think this is just, uh, just to editorialize here, I think the upgrading of the building does a lot more for you in terms of uh, advertising than the 
flashy uh, uh, electronic messaging aside, people like classy stuff. And I think I think I love the McDonald's upgrading. I think it looks terrific. So, is there a motion, Mr. Godek? Move the um, variances <clears throat> on this application. Is there support? Support. Support by Mr. Casada. Any discussion? Not seeing. Call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? You got your signs. Okay, Mr. Twang, let's see, we got signed variance. Okay, this is item number three, signed variance. <laughs> Request to replace menu boards while maintaining non-conforming freestanding sign with electronic message center for fast food drive through restaurant at 30807 Woodward Avenue. Uh, again, a uh, very similar request in the sense that uh, the first two items, A and B, are, are in regards to uh, the menu boards uh, having basically four, uh, the same configuration as uh, previous discussion. Again, item B is that the electronic message center covers 100% of that menu board versus and, and doesn't comply with that as aspect ratio. Item C and D have to do with the existing freestanding sign. Uh, you'll see that it's uh, too tall, um, and, and they're requesting to weigh 14 feet. Uh, for that menu board or, or for that freestanding sign as well as uh, the square footage uh, some 88.24 square feet uh, those are the uh, four items in front of you any questions for mr. Twain okay same petitioner yes okay. I am I can answer all the questions okay. we just that franchisee is not here okay um, so ditto <laughs> everything I said before um, for the previous door. But um, in addition to that, um, it does have the existing, uh, what you classify as a freestanding sign in front. Um, so I, I guess the question is, like you said, it, with adding the new additional signs, is it a requirement absolutely that that sign must come down? Is it that when uh, repairs or that sign were to be changed, would it then, uh, you know, like any new sign in front, only speaking to the monument sign, would um, it then be required to meet the current um, zoning requirements or a different type of sign at that point in time? Um, also, it, if that, I guess that would be one option. Well, if, that var if that doesn't explain the variance, I guess you could say, or if you don't approve that then would an option be to lower it so that it is um, within the appropriate height um, and then I guess the other question was I if, and I don't know if this applies maybe this is not the appropriate way to ask it but um, I know it says if we're changing any of the signs that's why the the monument sign has become an issue so we consider this project maintenance because I've, nothing else is being done but removing the existing menu boards and changing them out with like the digital and that's where everything else has come in. So if that's more maintenance than changing signage, would that be still classified? Well, in terms of the sign ordinance, it's not part of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the sign ordinance does not have anything that grandfathers or gives any any provision for uh, keeping something that doesn't comply. Uh, that's why it's listed. Uh, it's, it's not part of the zoning ordinance. It's a separate standalone ordinance uh, so that uh, signs that don't comply can be dealt with. And it's written in a fashion that says in order, if you need new signage, then you should bring all the signage into compliance okay. unless you get the variance. So unless they grant the variance, um, it would need to comply um, with current standards, whether you, that's a lowering or a total removal and something else, but it would have to comply. Yeah, and we that's absolutely acceptable. As he stated, that was done with the other store. Um, it's just every owner operator is different and they have different things what they're looking for in that particular area so <clears throat> and the owner is not here for this one for this one no okay mr. Godek 
Um, uh, we've been consistent in um, uh, fast food facilities on Woodward with uh, <clears throat> cleaning up the non-conforming freestanding. Mm -hmm. um, so I would make a motion to approve items A and B, which is their menu boards, but strike C and D. So you got to bring those into compliance. There's a motion on the table to approve A and B, and that's it. Is there a support on that? Support. Support by Mr. Kluster. Is there any discussion on this motion? I guess I'll just comment. I think I remember the last time we asked them to lower the main sign, but I guess that would come forward in a separate document, right? I mean, a different McDonald's. It wasn't this McDonald's. That's correct, and we also, about a year ago, uh, Arby's down the street, we, we had them lower the sign, too. So when Mr. Godek talks about consistency, that's... What does he mean? Okay. Just Burger the, King on Main Street. The Burger King, yeah. And also the, Burger, the new Burger King on uh, Woodward, too. So... Uh, any other discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So you are approved for A and B. Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I recommend that taking action on the other ones. Oh, to, to deny. Yeah, to deny. Yeah, I move we deny um, okay. C and D. Support. Approve A and B. And a motion by M Ms. Douglas. Support by Mr. Mr. Casada, okay. To deny C and D. Any discussion on this? That's what I tried to do. <laughs> but I appreciate the. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Liss. Thank you, Liss. Um, all those in favor of, the, favor of denying C and D say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Last item on the list is the proposed zoning ordinance tax amendments for the marijuana establishments and medical marijuana facilities. Uh, well, at the August meeting of the Planning Commission, we presented uh, uh, this report. Uh, it included uh, several options uh, in terms of, of uh, potential tax amendments. Uh, it, prevented, or it presented some draft language. Uh, it presented some draft definitions, uh, and staff went through, uh, I think, at that meeting. When we left, uh, I believe the Planning Commission wanted more time to review it, look at it. Uh, so we're, or I'm really here to, uh, I guess, take your input and uh, uh, questions. Um, basically, I don't know if you have any more. The next step, or whenever you're ready, um, would be to direct staff to put something out for <coughs> a, a public hearing, schedule a public hearing. Uh, given that there's options uh, included uh, in the draft, if you wanted that, I would ask that you identify which options you wanted us to include so that we're putting out a specific um, uh, wording. Um, uh, for that public hearing, so I don't know. I, I'm I'm here to answer questions more than anything else. So, Ms. Douglas. So we and I'm scrolling through here trying to find this segment. Um, we talked about um, uh, buffers around schools and churches. Um, we talked about uh, putting medical marijuana retail establishments into general business zoning. And we talked about buffers to keep them away from schools and churches. Um, we also talked about the possibility, or the document talks about the ability of setbacks from other um, uh, marijuana businesses. And there was one, only one setback distance suggested. Which well, staff only suggested that you have a setback from schools. Uh, we did not suggest that you have any setbacks from churches or um, parks or other types of locations. So our suggestion was that you only had a setback from uh, schools, K-12, uh, K as, as included in the statute. Now, whether that's 1,000 feet, 500 feet, uh, we included some maps 
uh, depending on, on how that would define the area. And you're correct, we, we, we suggested that certain, potentially certain businesses would be allowed as a special land use or certain types of licenses would be allowed as a special land use and general business, <coughs> that they, certain other ones could potentially be allowed in general industrial or some combination thereof of uh, where you wanted to go. And that was the basic three options. The definition section we simply pulled from the two statutes, the medical marijuana statute as well as the uh, recreational statute. And since they were slightly different, we've simply included all of them in the uh, draft uh, that has the definitions in it. So if you turn to page 10 of 14 and 11 of 14, that's really, really the options of where uh, certain types of uses or licenses may be permitted, whether it's uh, marijuana microbusinesses, retailers, designated business. consumption establishments, uh, provisioning centers, so on. But you did also talk about a 1,000-foot th buffer from schools and a 1,000-foot setback between all right. marijuana uses, right. meaning that the city could potentially issue 11 licenses for marijuana businesses at properties zone general business and eight at site zone general industrial. Right, depending on the distance between them. And right, but does, uh, is that just a number? That is, you didn't look, I mean, when you say 11 licenses for marijuana businesses, I mean, if you put one in location a, the, the, the first one's going to impact the next one. Right. And, and our number was based on the most optimum placement of, of licenses. That really was, if you look at Woodward Avenue and you establish a distance between schools, the map is going to say, okay, you can have this segment of Woodward, which right. has general business. If you stick the first medical marijuana establishment in the middle, it's going to impact how many others can go in that segment. If you start at the optimum place of all of them, we thought you could get 11 just on 1,000 feet. Is it possible there wouldn't, couldn't be any? I mean, based on stores that are, you know, property that is available, Occupy. Well, we're not guaranteeing anybody that someone's going to sell and they can open. We're simply saying that you could potentially open one. Um, there is no guarantee that a, a property owner will sell you a piece of property or a, or a landlord will give you a... But that's not our charge. Um, all we're simply doing is if the city wants to allow uh, opt-in for these types of establishments, here's your opportunity to set some parameters. So particularly in the industrial zones, I mean, if there are only eight available, at, you know, but, you know, given this, those setbacks, um, we might exclude them entirely. Well, and again, the industrial, you, you may allow grow facilities and processors, um, which you aren't going to allow in general business. Right. Um, or in, in another area. So you may, you may only get one or two given the availability of property that's got a facility that meets what they need. So then it just comes down to these businesses having the negotiating savvy and deep pockets to right. buy out somebody's business if they so choose. Correct. Okay. Um, second item, and I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing my fellow commissioners' comments on this. I, the people who are in favor of, um, uh, what are they, the craft businesses? Um, Mom and pops? The micro businesses. Micro businesses. I, I think they make a persuasive case. Um, I mean, I think there's something, I mean, just as we have craft beer and craft, you know, spirits, I mean, I think there's something to be said for people who are growing what they sell and responsible for what they sell. Um, and they make, I, I think, a valid case that if we just stick this in general business, um, they're not going to be able to afford it. They're going to be priced out of it. On the other hand, I look at, for example, our neighborhood business zoning categories up and down Crooks, Maine, Rochester, 
11, 12, 13, and those all, there are a lot of businesses there, which means we could have a lot of micro businesses there um, in close proximity to residential neighborhoods, and I'm not crazy about that either. Um, and I have no, I wondered if anyone else had thought this through and had any thoughts on how we might offer that opportunity without having it all over the city. Mr. Casada. Okay, well, first of all, let me just say, I think the, for the lawyers, good job on these reports. Uh, I, I thought this was very informative and uh, appreciated. Uh, What's that? Was well, Dave signed it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, good job. Um, and, and you set out a number of um, options. Here's, here's what I say. Obviously, the, 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 there's been an overwhelming vote in favor of this. Uh, I'm not looking to choke it off before it starts. But on the other hand, uh, this is a new horizon. This is a new frontier. Uh, we really don't know how it's going to affect anything. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people with pros and cons, but I think if you start off uh, with restrictions, you can always take them off. But if you don't have the restrictions on, putting them back on can be pretty tough. So for that reason, just a, as a practical matter, um, I, after I read this, and I don't have my mind made up about it, but I, I would certainly be more in favor of a thousand foot uh, perimeter around schools. As for the religious facilities, for the religious facilities that have schools, you don't need a buffer on them because if you already got a thousand feet around the school, like Shrine and St. Mary's and uh, St. Paul's Lutheran, it's not going to make any difference. I would like to hear from those religious facilities that don't have a school before I would make up my mind whether or not they think they need a buffer or not. So I wouldn't have an opinion on that until I heard from them. Um, I think there's a big issue about are we going to allow neighborhood uh, business one and two, and I guess I would say my initial inclination would be to say no for now. Uh, if, if a mom and pop store can't survive on Woodward or the other uh, general, uh, okay, well, for now, and if everything goes well and, and people like the businesses that come in and that it works, then we can take that we can expand the zones where they can do business. So that would be my inclination. The most important thing for me, you know, to me, okay, I think we all know that there are people who have been using marijuana even when it wasn't legal, okay? What? No. <laughs> so are you sure about been, that? <laughs> it's been in our neighborhoods. It's highly speculative. Right, it's been in our neighborhoods. It's been, it's been around my town. In so it's not that the introduction of the use is going to cause lower pop property value or something like that. What I am concerned about is, from my experience, is that when I go around other communities and see the provisioning centers and the medical marijuana, I have never seen a group of business people who had less taste than these people. <laughs> the obnoxious <laughs> lighting and, I mean, it's terrible. So I really endorse what, uh, what's being proposed in Article 5 here about uh, limiting the signage. I definitely would limit uh, any of those stupid lights, green lights around the windows. Um, one sign, no electronic messaging, I would say here's a great opportunity to say you've got to come in uh, here with a licensed architect, not engineer, who, who gives us, brings us the plans. I would be very explicit about that. That's what I would be concerned about, being a negative impact on the community. So that's my comments. Ms. Douglas. Yeah, I will say that Mr. Twing and I had a lengthy discussion about those obnoxious lights around the windows. Um, and his conclusion is there's no, there's little you can do about it. Now, maybe that's different if we're taking the initiative at the start to prohibit those things. I think now's the time to experiment with it. Well, I, I took that position from a different, I think this statute allows you to write some regulations that prohibit them. Okay, so good. I, in terms of this, if you really want to get in, you, you, you could prohibit them. Okay, City great. We, we'd like to... Mr. Godek. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, I agree with um, some of Mr. Casada's comments. I, I guess as I was reading this, uh, though the 1,000 feet, 500 feet, um, some of the write-up here say it wouldn't significantly 
change the number either way. Um, and I guess if you got if you put the thousand feet around uh, religious, you, you're basically cutting out the CBD. Um, so you wouldn't have anything there at all. So I would be more in favor of something less restrictive. Um, you know, the 500 foot thing would be okay with me. Um, and uh, other comments about restricting the businesses for uh, signage, I think, is well said, and I agree. But the, that would be a sub. I mean, that's a subsequent thing after we approve the the potential zoning changes. Then we write a sign ordinance, or do we have to? Have that <coughs> no, I would. One I would add it all in as part of your special land use action and approval. I'd, I'd add it to your zoning requirements for special land use that you're only entitled to a particular sign. There will be only certain types of lighting, or certain lighting will be prohibited. I'd put it all right in here as a condition right of your special Article, land okay. use approval. Right? This, this is the, the, t the text amendments you're proposing. It, it's listed under Article 5, right? I'm not sure special what Special provisions. That's what I read. This is what... I, don't know, you can't I can't see, see what that is from there. Okay. I, I that's what I was. Is, that's what I was looking at. Right, but you you referenced some documents signed by the city attorney, but the report that's attached is written by the planning office. So I'm not sure what you're looking at. <coughs> this says uh, zoning ordinance text amendments, page 12 of 14, 13 of 14. Right, that's, that's what it. I'm looking yep. at. Right, and that's where we would put it. We would put and and I just to I'll shut up in a second. But I would be in favor of limiting it to the general business and industrial for now. I have a question though. If we Hold on one second. You said limit to general business and industrial with uh, which buffer? 1,000 foot for schools. 1,000 foot for schools. And not 500 foot for schools. No, 1,000. Okay. Um, so then what, on that thought, then what Mr. Godek says, that would limit anything in the uh, uh, central the, business district? The, the write-up I saw was um, if you did religious... Uh, well, under, under, understand if you if you limit it to general business and industrial, the central business district is precluded. It's you, it's, it's, it's a zoning district yeah, in out. and of itself. Okay. So you you wouldn't allow any in the downtown. They wouldn't even so, be considered. So then, if the, you just the pick, buffer is meaningless. So if you pick number two, five hundred foot buffer from schools, it could go anywhere. Well, five hundred so. buffer from schools is right. is a measurement from the school. The zoning district is where you would allow them to occur. So if you have an office service zoning district or a neighborhood business zoning district or neighborhood business two or a mixed use one or a mixed use two, all of those are prohibited from potentially having these operations. Only general business. And general industrial zoning. General industrial. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Sorry. That's all right. So, and because there's different types of businesses, there's like six different types of businesses, and the city commission is going to decide whether they're going to allow any or some or all of them. One thing I wasn't clear on, if the city commission does allow, uh, does opt in, does that bring all the medical marijuana with it too, or does that have to be a different opt-in? be a different opt-in. So would that be a different ordinance, or these are just all, this, your provisions would be for any and all marijuana yeah, businesses we've, whether we've drafted this not. to allow both types right. um, but there are uh, medical marijuana you, unless you opted in as a city you were out so so, the, so for us on the on this commission to make a recommendation we don't know we'll know we'll not know what gets approved so our, whatever we recommend has to cover everything yes and if the if the commission wants to preclude something they'll take it out Uh, in Article 4, there's option 1, 2, and 3, 3 being limited to just industrial. I'm not seeing the difference in 1 and 2. Can you explain what the difference between option 1 and option 2 is? What page you on? 10 of 14. Article 4. four. Ten. Ten of nine. Is it Which one? Only general, and then one is mixed, and then one is only page industrial. 10. Else so that. ten, so ten of fourteen oh. in our document. It's Article Four, Zone Regulations, General Provisions. 
it defines the, it's basically defining the zoning districts where it would be allowed. Okay. And it looks to I'm not option one, option two, to me look like they're the same language. I'm just trying to understand if if and what the difference would be. Three is clearly it says it's only an industrial. Uh, option one, if I think if you read what's in the highlight, it's the intent of what that option would have occur. And then if you read the highlight under above option two, you'll see what the difference is there. It's a matter of facilities, I believe. Okay, all the differences in the industrial. So option two lets you to do anything in industrial? Yes. Okay. The same for the general. Any other yeah, comments? And I, and I think the, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the point of option two is that if there is a I probably have this wrong. A grower who also wants to have a store, they can put them next to each other in the industrial district. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Kazan? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I hesitate to, to endorse at this time the 1,000 feet or buffer between businesses somewhat just because of what Commissioner Douglas just suggested is that somebody might go into industrial area and, and they might do more than one type of thing or there you know there might be related businesses that have a synergy there you know like a, a, a there's different type of businesses I don't know everything they do they process they grow they transport uh, they test and those things m might have some synergy near each other so I don't know why we would say you have to have a thousand foot buffer I'm not you know it's not just retailers that we're talking about here so, well, if you're running it under one, the same person has the same license or has multiple license at the same piece of property, that would be treated as one location. No, but they if might what, not. Though. If what, well, might be different businesses. Okay, then then you would have whatever number of properties we identified. All of them could then become facilities. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the business. The growers may not be the same type of people as the testers. But if you don't put any addition, if you don't put any separation between the two of them, mm -hmm. every business that's not, every business that's out, property that's outside a thousand feet could become a facility. Could have a blocks and blocks of them. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I have that fear, but okay, I get it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the separation requirement, at least at the starting point, makes sense. And I think to your point where we can roll back regulations later, it's harder to implement new regulations and say, oh, well, now we have all these non-compliant situations, like, well, well we're stuck. Um, so I, I tend to support separating the, or instituting the, the distance separation requirement. Ms. Beakey. I'll, I'll just comment that I, I, I would tend to agree on that note to be more conservative up front while making certain allowances. Um, and again, on the aesthetics, I agree with everything that's been said. I guess at my first glance, I would even be willing to go as far as limiting it to only general industrial, including those setback issues. But again, I may be persuaded by others that general business makes sense in the mix too. But that would, on my first read, I like the idea of starting out a little slow and then if everything goes well, moving into more spaces, um, as far as allowances go or permission. That's just my. Ms. Douglas. So something to think about there is, I mean, if you say they're only going to go into industrial, I mean, industrial neighborhoods are not set, set up necessarily for retail traffic. I mean, it would, the just sort of the nature of the streets, the access roads, and so forth. Um, it seems like general business, which in this case is Woodward Avenue, is better suited towards 
retail. Um, and I wouldn't want to just confine retail at this point to industrial zoning. I guess, I guess in some of the areas which, and I have to look at what the current zone is exactly, there's some that seem to be converting, like there's different uses and small businesses, I think, around the, like, um, Bellamere. I don't know if I can think of exact streets right now, but places where it looks industrial, but yet there's other things in that space. And so just off the top of my head without doing research on the spaces, I feel like there are some spaces. But again, I'm not necessarily saying that I would absolutely be against the general business. That would be my first inclination at first blush if we're just discussing where we're at now as a preliminary discussion. Would you be looking for a motion to move to the well, commission I, I think tonight? I've heard, I think I've heard several. Well, you don't have to do anything right now. Okay. Um, I'm, you wanted more time, so I put it back on the agenda to discuss it. At some point, we would look for uh, which option you would prefer uh, in terms of drafting it so that we could put it out uh, for a public notice and a public hearing. Um, I think it's hard for the public to digest three options, so uh, I think I'd like to pin it down uh, to either option one, option two, option three, or some modification thereof. I mean, if uh, if there are, if, if you, uh, by, let's say you didn't want to allow com consumption uh, establishments at all, that's something you could, could pre preclude. As, as Mr. Gillum has indicated to the commission, that type of license isn't specifically identified in the statute. So he believes that's one of the types that you could specifically exclude. Would that be us excluding or the commission? No, the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance, if you, you could recommend that consumption, consumption establishments be excluded entirely. Okay. So, I mean, you got a variety here, but, but the, the, the items, the license types that are included in the recreational marijuana, if the city commission opts in, you've got to deal with all of them in some way other than the four licenses added by the licensing bureau. Ms. Douglas? My inclination would be to opt out of any of those. There's consumption establishments and special events, right. which are, are not in the, on the law but in the rules. Right. Rule those out for now. I, I mean, that would be my recommendation. Oh, I need to make that motion? I could. Yeah. Nope. Now, but um, no, it's, but at some point, that's in terms of drafting what we're allowing in general business, and what we're allowing in general industrial. How do you want us to I, to deal with that? I don't know how. I mean, other people can look at the options. I like option two. I, I tend to agree. The, the only difference is the retail functions in the industrial, and I think allowing those retail functions in the industrial very similar to a microbrewery or something like that where you have kind of those industrial functions coupled with the retail component. I, I think it makes sense for this type of establishment. And since I'm talking, I also like a 1,000 feet from schools and a 1,000 foot setback from other marijuana businesses. Just, just me talking. Okay. Well, I, I guess I, um, I'm probably in the minority here, but um, I, I would lean towards less restrictive. Um, but from what I'm hearing from the rest of this body is that it's going the other way. So if you look at 500 feet from schools versus 1,000, it doesn't affect much. I guess I was also looking at um, like the results from that we got from the community. Um, that was okay with a lot of the things being combined. You know, it's like a lot of it was like in the sixty percent um, combining uh, support um, for retailers in certain areas, and even in the you know even in the downtown. I see your point with being somewhat restricted to start off and, and then opening up things as you move on, but I, I, I kind of see that, um, 
I think less restrictive is where the community it wants you to head. We're only a thousand foot from other businesses. What uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because it limits the numbers for now, without us without us dictating how many are possible, which we have learned will get us into nothing but hot water legally. I mean, if we say we only want 10 of these and five of those, um, then we wind up s setting standards for how we choose them, and we wind up in court because nobody likes our standards. Um, so it looks like the 1,000-foot setback, in addition to the 1,000-foot buffer, lowers the number and gives us some t buys us time to see what happens. Okay. I think one of the unintended consequences that you mentioned before, those too, is like um, it, as you go to this restricted level, it, it's going to be big dollar investors that are only going to be able to to um, invest in this business. You, know, you, you are going to limit your people that can do this. Well, and I made a, it. And you're, you're right, it's going to be the big money people at first. But, and I do, as I said, I do like the idea of allowing micro businesses, um, but I also like the idea of proceeding slowly. And if we allow, you know, if we, do, if we don't open up our neighborhood business zoning classifications for these micro businesses for a year, I mean, a year later, they're still going to be around and still going to be wanting to open that business. Well, and you may have some actual evidence that the argument that they can't open on Woodward is true. Good. Right. Rather than just someone's opinion. Or maybe they will find, you know, industrial spots. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm in favor of the micro-businesses, but... <coughs> I want to, as others have said here, let's d dip our toes in the water. Okay. Does the commission want to look at this, continue to look at this and bring it back again? Or what, what are you? Well, I'm going to go back and, and redraft it. Uh, okay. It sounds like option two. We'll make some tweaks to it. Um, we'll make some comments on a revised report regarding your micro business and those comments and some other things, and we'll bring it back next month. If it looks good next month, then I would suggest you set it for a public hearing in, okay. in uh, would be December, no, November, and uh, go from there. Okay. Just curious. I, I thought it was uh, very nice that uh, there was a poll, and I read that. Is there currently a, a method for the public to comment? Is there a, does anybody know? I don't, uh, I should ask Judy Davids or something. Comment on? On, on, on what we're doing here. Because this is, this is public. People are watching this, assume, presumably. We get four or five calls a day. Is, is there a website or something? I'm just <laughs> wondering what people are saying. You have to hire a staff Oh, how we can follow the comments. <laughs> right? Is that what you're suggesting? No, how I'm we just could... wondering if there, there are comments uh, that, uh, that, uh, the commissioners uh, could look at, or do we do we have to wait until there's a public hearing, and then, then uh, we're you, gonna, you, you would know. generally wait for the public hearing because it's not a comment. You don't have anything you're really presenting. It's just a report. You don't have specific language. Um, frankly, we're refusing to meet with anyone on this issue because there is nothing on this issue. The city's position is you can't do this in town until there's some provision in place that uh, the. Planning Commission is authorized to put out for a public hearing. Uh, we're not meeting with anyone. Okay. Are you going to take a crack at signage also? As signage you? on this issue? Yes, as Commissioner Casada. Oh, absolutely. Good. Yeah. And, and lighting as well. Okay, That's so all I got. We don't need to, we can move on to item number F or item letter F. <laughs> I don't know, I put my glasses away already. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there support? Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Good night.